Today from Newark, Delaware, it's an in-state rival game as the Blue Hens of Delaware welcome in the Hornets from Delaware State. Both teams are perfect in this young season. It's the CAA versus the MEAC in the Route 1 rivalry with the first state cup on the line. And it's next on the NBC Sports Network. to Delaware Stadium on the campus of the University of Delaware. Today, it's the Blue Hands welcoming in the Hornets of Delaware State. And hello once again, everyone. Todd Harris along with the pride of Princeton University, Ross Tucker. This is a backyard battle of brothers. Delaware State makes the trap up north, and no doubt this is a big rivalry game. Season's very young, but they need this one in a big way. Oh, well, this is huge in the state of Delaware. I mean, the Delaware Blue Hens, they are one of the elite programs in all of FCS football. For Delaware State, this is a chance for some respect for their program. All right, let's talk about Delaware and the players that will get them the points they need. Their quarterback, again, the transfer thing continues to be a situation for Delaware. They bring a lot of guys in that like to transfer, and they seem to have success. Well, and Trent Hurley got off to a great start in the first game last week against Westchester. He really got the job because of his mobility. He had three touchdowns over 300 yards, but he did also have three interceptions. He needs to improve that today. He'll do that in no small part by getting the ball to Andrew Pierce. Andrew Pierce can do it all. He can catch passes out of the backfield. He's a very willing blocker. And oh yeah, as a junior in his second game, he already has over 3,000 yards as one of the top 20 players in all of FCS football. And the man that makes it go for the Hornets of Delaware State is Nick Elko. He is the quarterback, but he's got a lot of speed behind him at the skill positions. Yeah, Delaware State's loaded at all the different skill positions. Nick Elko is really more of a distributor. Get the ball out of his hands as quickly as he can to guys like Justin Wilson, Malcolm Williams, and of course, Travis Tarpley. Travis Tarpley led the entire conference, the MEAC, in all-purpose yards last year, and you can see where he ranks in the MEAC. He is a little guy, but he's dynamite. He's got speed to burn, and he'll make a lot of guys miss on his way to the end zone. Before we get things underway here at Delaware Stadium, let's check in with a third member of our broadcast team. Here's Carolyn Mano. Todd, thank you. Here with Delaware head coach Casey Keeler. And Casey, your sophomore quarterback threw for over 300 yards in his debut last week. What do you expect from Trent Hurley today? Well, you know, the best times that he's had on this campus have been when we've been in scrimmages or in games. So he loves game day. I expect the exact same thing. You know, Lindell, little windy out here today. You got to go do, go do good job protecting him, running the ball, take some pressure off him. I think he'll be fine. Defensively, you're depleted in your linebacking core, missing four of your top six guys. What adjustments will you make defensively to compensate for that? Well, one of the nice things, we get two defensive linemen back. So I think we'll have more depth in the defensive line. Hopefully, the defensive line will take care of its business. Our linebackers are good players. We just have to do a better job fitting the run. Uh, what I expect from Dell State, they come out throwing the football, but we'll see some wild catches like we saw last week. Coach, good luck. Thank you very much. Okay. Todd, back to you. All right, thank you very much, Carolyn. It is the Route 1 rivalry when we come back to Delaware Stadium. It's Delaware State taking on the Blue Hens of Delaware. Game two, Delaware State's going to be a big game for us. First time we played was in 2007. It was probably one of the most electric games in that stadium. The more we play, the bigger the rivalry is going to become. Back at Delaware Stadium here in Newark, Delaware. Today it is the Route 1 rivalry between Delaware and Delaware State. And before we get to the kickoff, let's send it down to Carolyn Mano. Todd, thank you very much. Here with Delaware State head coach Kermit One. And coach, we talked earlier in the week. We present challenges offensively at a variety of positions. What do you expect from them today? Well, you know, I expect Delaware to come out really, really physical and strong. Uh, you know, we expect that from this football team. This is a really, really good football team that uh, Coach Casey has. They're very experienced. And we're just going to have to stay poised and, and play for four quarters. This is going to be a dogfight. It's not going to be easy to task. This is a big state rivalry. Your guys have not won this game yet. How motivated are they right now to prove that they belong here? Well, you know, it's, it's not so much about the state of Delaware as, 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 as well as it's about Delaware State. We want to play well. We want to play well every week we go out. This is actually just another ball game, but that cup means the world to us. Coach, thank you very much. Good luck today. Thank you. Todd. 
All right, thank you very much, Carolyn, as we get set to go here in the first state. First state cup, as Carolyn mentioned, is very important, and Delaware State has yet to take it back to Dover. They'll try to rectify that today. Weather could be an issue a little later on in the broadcast, but right now we are good to go, and the stadium will fill up quickly as this is the big show in town. There's no question about it. I tell people all the time that the CAA, the conference in which Delaware resides, that is the best conference in all of FCS football. It's pretty much indisputable at this point. And these games here at Delaware, this is as big of a deal as any other game, any other location in FCS football, right up there with Montana. Sean Boehner, number 20, to do the kicking duties for Delaware. He'll be kicking off to Travis Tarpley, number 5, and 25, Malcolm Williams. Deep kick into the end zone. Tartley says, let it go. Touchback. They'll bring it out, and we will be underway as the join already starts down between the red and white and the blue and gold. Starting lineups for Delaware State brought to you by Discover. There you see the big front line, youth on one side, and the big play receiver is Justin Wilson. That's who Nick Elko likes to get the ball to. Guy's got big, big time hands, as the coaches call him. Yeah, he was the preseason player of the year in the league last year before he had an ankle injury. They expect him to round back in his 2010 form. So on first and 10 from the 25, Elko dropping back to pass, has plenty of time and finds his man right off the bat. It's Tarpley who takes it out to about the 38-yard line, finally pushed out by Tim Breaker and Travis Hawkins as we take a look at the defensive starters for the Blue Hands. Up front, they'll go with a three-man front. Karan Gibson anchors at 5'11", 300 pounds. Paul Worrell, though, you'll hear his name called a lot, maybe the best player on the team, and the man in the backfield, Ricky Tunstall, number four. One play, nice pickup for the Hornets. It's a first and 10, now ball resting at the 38. Elko out of the gun, Tarpley in motion. He swings it back to the man out of the backfield. That's Malcolm Williams. And Williams will pick up about four yards, finally taken down to the turf there by the Blue Hands, Quincy Barr, number 90. I really like what I've seen the first two plays from the Delaware State offense. The first play, play action, Delaware gave up over 200 yards last week to Westchester's running back. So the chance for them, as you see Nick Elko, what he did last week to get a play-action pass on first down because you know the Delaware Blue Hens were expecting run. Second down and seven now with the ball at the 41. To the running game they go. They go up the middle with number 25, Malcolm Williams, and not a lot of running room there. Once again, it's Quincy Barr, the 6'3 senior from Brandon, Florida, making a stop. One of the things to watch early in this game is that Delaware is basically, Todd, going to a different defense. They're basically going with a 3-3-5 today because they want to get their best players on the field, and they feel like their five defensive backs should all be on the field. Their defensive coordinator, Nick Rapone, said, we've never done it here before. Think about that. Third down and four on the opening drive for the Hornets. The ball resting at the 44. Elko will pass with pressure coming, has time and a beautiful release, and there he is, Justin Wilson, covered by Marcus Burley, but Burley couldn't get there enough, and they moved the chains. Yeah, and we'll take a look at Justin Wilson. He's at the top of your screen. It's just a little bit of a comeback route. He comes back to it, really a soft cushion there by Marcus Burley. I'm surprised he's playing that far off, especially given the down and distance. You have to expect them to run a route to the chains like that. First and 10 for the Hornets on their opening drive, and they are in Blue Hen territory. And play is stopped on the field. It's going to be a timeout for the University of Delaware. Timeout, Delaware. That's it for the timeout of the half. So Casey Keeler in his 11th season, not happy with what he's seen so far by his Blue Hen defense. I'll try to fix it. We come back, the Hornets on the drive. The recent health care. Early going here at the Route 1 rivalry, Casey Keeler in his 11th season as a head coach for the Blue Hens, not happy the way his defense is playing. And that is something that they told us, you know, they're a little thin, a little inexperienced. 
Well, and I think that that's why he called timeout right there, Todd. They were misaligned. Remember, we just mentioned it. They're going to a 3-3-5. That's not Delaware football. Delaware has always been a 4-3 team. And so he saw the guys misaligned. Rather than let the play go, they banged the timeout. Hornets already picking up two first downs, and they are in blue hen territory now. First and 10 from the 49. Boy, and you got to respect the patience that Nick Elko feels out there. He is just picking him off. You mentioned they're going to a 3-3-5. Nick Rapone, the defensive coordinator, says we are nowhere near full strength. And look at this list of linebackers this early in the season that they are out. Yeah, that's four of their five best linebackers. I mean, Nick told us yesterday in our meeting with him, our defense is decimated right now. Hence the 3-3-5, so second down and four. Elko perfect so far, four for four, and he'll come out firing again. This time he goes deeper, and the defensive back is there to push the receiver out of bounds. Justin Wilson contact early. Well, and I'll tell you why they did that. They had beat Burley underneath a couple times, and they thought they might get him to bite and see if Wilson could go by him. You see Burley came up and went a little bit more of a bump and run. That left hand right there, a <laughs> little bit of off. a tug right there. <laughs> I always love the guys after they're holding. It's only after you're holding that you let your hands up like that and say, I didn't do it. Don't do that. When you say, I didn't do it, that means we know that you just did it. Third down and four, the ball resting at the 43 of the blue hands. Elko out of the gun. Quick drop, has his man, goes up the ladder and brings it down. A great catch by Justin Bruton. He's covered by Travis Hawkins, but another first down for the Hornets. Yeah, Bruton's a guy that doesn't get a whole lot of attention, but you'll see Elko has time, steps into it, and Bruton at 6'3", 220, is able to climb the ladder and grab that ball. Elko doing a really nice job thus far spreading the football around. Well, for head coach Kermit Blunt in his second season as the head man for the Hornets, he's got to be happy with this opening drive. Not only are they chewing up clock, but they are a balanced attack using a lot of throwing, and now they'll go to the three receivers set to the top of the screen. And Elko just changed the play, moved Malcolm Williams, the tailback, to the other side. First and 10 from the 34. <laughs> Radimov, number 78, the left tackle, got an early start. False start, number 78 of the offense. It's a five-yard penalty, second down. And you know why that happened? Because they were in their stance too long. I can tell you, when you're 320 pounds, it is not fun to be in your stance that long. You get anxious. You know, last year, the penalties were the least in the MEAC, and they did a good job last week in the MEAC, but already off to a penalty here. First and 15, they back it up to the 39. Same formation for the Hornets. Elko out of the gun. Three receivers to the left. Elko goes right, has his man, takes a shot but holds on to it. Justin Wilson, he was covered well by Hawkins and Breaker and still came down with it. Perfectly timed pass by Nick Elko right there. And you're seeing why Justin Wilson was the preseason player of the year in the entire MEAC last year. Drops it in the bucket between Hawkins, the corner, and the safety. Listen. <laughs> Takes a pretty good shot at the end of that from Breaker right in the chops. A 23-yard pickup for the Hornets, and it's now first and 10 from the 16. Same formation. This time they throw it up. Beats his man almost on the tip. Travis Hawkins got a mid on the ball, but he tipped it back into the end zone, and Wilson just couldn't bring it in. That was the right read by Nick Elko. He had man-to-man -to, -man to his near side. Hawkins just able to recover, just a fingertip. I mean, that's they talk about game of inches, three more inches, that's a touchdown for Delaware State. So they are going right at the 2011 All-CAA second teamer, Travis Hawkins, early on here. Nick Elko having a great first quarter. They have had the ball the entire game as we are now 10.42 to play in the first quarter, and it's all Hornets on a second and 10 from the 16. Confusion on the field, and Elko has to burn a timeout. So both teams using up a timeout early here at Delaware Stadium. You know, it's interesting because if you're Delaware, you got to be really concerned right now. I mean, the strength of Delaware's defense is supposed to be their secondary. They're all upperclassmen. They've all gotten a lot of playing time. We mentioned earlier, that's why they're playing five DBs. I mean, that that is... And Delaware State is just marching the ball down the field on them through the air. 
Well, let's take a moment and check out our Coors Light Cold Hard Facts. And Ross, uh, you talk about this team and how important they are. This is the fourth meeting between the two schools. Delaware leads 3-0. and And when we spoke with Kermit Blunt early this week and asked him about the Route 1 rivalry and the first state cup, he said, we got to get our hands on that thing. We haven't had it yet. After three meetings, they'd like to take that back to the state capital and Dover. Early going here at Delaware Stadium on the campus of UD. It's all Hornets. Second down and 10. Ball at the 16. Tarpley in motion. Elko, quick slant down low, has his receivers, Josh Bailey, and Bailey corralled quickly down at the 12. Number 57, the true freshman, Jeff Williams, there to make the stop. Williams, one of those players for Delaware that quite frankly, really probably would not be playing right. if it were not for the injuries. You know, he's to be the type of kid as a youngster, he'd be mainly on special teams here. But nice tackle there, brings up a gigantic third down early in this ball game. Four receivers set for the Hornets. It's a third and six ball resting at the 12 of the Blue Hens. Dangerous pass, almost picked off, and it looked like Jeff Williams read that perfectly the whole way. Elko was trying to thread the needle to Justin Wilson in too many blue shirts. Todd, you said it exactly right. Take a look at this. There was nowhere to go with the ball. I am really surprised Nick Elko tried to fit it in there because if Williams picks that off, not only does Delaware State not get a field goal attempt, he might have been able to take that the other direction to the house. And if he doesn't get it, Jake Justy, the junior from Neptune Beach, Florida, is certainly in a position to grab it. So they bring on Mitchell Ward to do the kicking. And this one is blocked. Special teams play by the Blue Hens, and they turn away the Hornets as Zach Kerr was the first man to knock it down. Marcus Bailey there on the coverage. Special teams are the things you never talk about. Look at the middle of your screen. Number 95, you said it. Zach Kerr gets his hands up there. And Leif Walschlager as well, number 46, was behind him. Big play for Delaware. They'll get the ball for the first time when we come back here on NBC Sports Network. Back in Delaware Stadium, the Blue Hens quick to get their offense going under Trent Hurley's guide. Remember, as Ross pointed out, the transfer from Bowling Green, the coaches say he's a real gamer, and the key for him, he said, he told us last night, I cannot have any turnovers. So that'll bring up a third down and five from the 46. Hurley looking down, has his man, cannot bring it in. And maybe a little too much heat on that pass. He was looking for his receiver, number 21, Stephen Clark. Yeah, and that's one of the things the coaches told us is that at times on the crossing patterns, Hurley will put a little bit too much mustard on the football. That time it was too hot to handle. Raleigh Zaragoza back to put it away for the Blue Hens. So a three and out after the Hornets drive the length of the field. Their field goal is blocked. Blue Hens now have to give it away. And Zaragoza, an interesting punter. He can go rugby left. He can go rugby right. Or he can go right up the middle. Either way, that was a beautiful punt into the end zone. Tarpley, no opportunity for a return. So we've had an opportunity to see both teams on offense, and uh, you got to be impressed with what the Hornets did on that opening drive. There's no question about it. We talked about it. Delaware State wants to get the ball to the perimeter in the hands of their playmakers. Delaware's got to be a little stunned. I, I think Delaware thought that Delaware State would come out and try to run the football. Right. That's not really what happened. I mean, Delaware State said, we don't care what Westchester did last week. We're going to come out and do what we do, and that is get the ball out in the perimeter to our playmakers as quickly as possible. How about this? That first drive cleaned up five minutes and six seconds, went 62 yards, four first downs that yielded no points after the blocked field goal attempt. And here they are on drive number two. They'll start things off with a heavy dose of running as number 25, Malcolm Williams, the junior from Reading, Pennsylvania. You know that area well, Ross. Yeah, Malcolm's actually from my hometown in southeastern Pennsylvania, about an hour west of Philadelphia he committed to Temple coming out of high school but things didn't work out there he's now a Hornet he's got a lot of speed we'll see him return kicks as well four receivers set now on a second down and two with the ball resting at the 28 Elko under center for the first time 
Hands it off to Williams up the middle. He dives forward, gets to about the 31. That's going to be close. Depends on the mark. Looks like he's got enough for a first down. As we take a look at that early drive, really two defensive plays that took place in the red zone for the Blue Hens. Well, and the first one was Travis Hawkins with his recovery speed to knock that ball away. And the second one, Jeff Williams almost intercepted and took it in the other direction. Speaking with head coach Nick Rapone, excuse me, defensive coordinator Nick Rapone, saying the young guys are going to have to step up big for us, especially early on in the season as they fill holes. Missing from injuries, losing four of their top six linebackers. First and ten. And miscommunication that time. Justin Wilson broke off the route to the inside, and Elko was looking long. Well, and I'll tell you what happens there. Justin Wilson has an option based upon how he feels like Marcus Burley, the corner, is covering him. And the quarterback, Nick Elko, he tries to read what Justin Wilson is going to do. You said it, though, not on the same page. It was man-to-man -man bump and run. Elko thought Wilson was going to run a nine route, which is just straight down the field as fast as he can. That'll bring up a second down and 10. Ball at the 31. Once again, Elko under center. Three receivers to the bottom. Keen on Tarpley as the defense as they go to the running game. And Malcolm Williams taken down by number 46, Leif Walschlager, the sophomore from Alexandria, Virginia. Yeah, Walschlager looks the part, doesn't he? Yeah. As a sophomore, are you kidding me? He's all of 6'5", 265 pounds. He's been one of the guys they can really count on. He's got a lot of ability. And they're hoping he turns into an all-conference player as an upperclassman. Third down and six. Elko will go back out of the gun with a four-receiver set. Pressure coming. Elko steps up, able to elude it, has his man open, and a beautiful pass and catch all the way out to the 45. Another first down. It's Justin Bruton that came down with it. Well, and the key here is that Elko has a lot of time because they're only rushing with three people, and then he buys more time. Once he gets on the perimeter, it really stresses the defense. He had a couple guys open, and Bruton has become his go-to man. Quincy Barr applying the pressure, chasing Elko out of the pocket, but a first down nonetheless for the Hornets, now with the 45. Tarpley in motion. They'll swing out of the back. A lot of running room. And a great piece of work by Dehan Chong, the freshman from Coatesville, Pennsylvania. Ricky Tunstill has to come up from the free safety position and get him out of bounds. Yep, another southeastern Pennsylvania running back for the Hornets. And they've run this play a couple times. Delaware is in a zone, but he's able to make Warlow who's an NFL prospect, miss in the open field. Pretty impressive for a freshman right there. And another first down for the Hornets. First and 10 now from the 42 into Blue Hen territory once again. Elko doing a great job out of the gun. Three receiver sets to the bottom of your screen. And he goes left this time. Justin Wilson for a small pickup. Marcus Burley on the coverage. I mean, Elko's pretty much on fire. Uh, I mean, you got you to call it as it is. Elko is in a rhythm right now. And Delaware has five defensive backs out there. That's what's got to be the most concerning for them because they, there really is no other defense they could put out there that's better suited to stop the passing game with the Delaware State Hornets. One tendency that you do see is when they do throw the trips to the bottom of the screen, it seems like they always go to the weak side. This time they come right back. Tartley left uncovered. And if you're University of Delaware, that's probably the one guy you need to know. Williams and Tunstill close in on him, but another pickup of about seven more yards. Move the chains. There is no defense that Delaware has in which you just completely leave Travis Tarpley wide open in the slot. That was a mental error by someone. Not exactly sure who, but somebody has to be covering him. So the Hornets pick up their eighth first down here with 4.52 still to play in the first quarter. Elko out of the gun once again on first and 10 from the 29. He's going to lob this one up. And he overthrows his receiver, Justin Wilson, who's covered by Travis Hawkins. We now set it down to the field with Carolyn Mano. God, thank you. Delaware's offensive line does look a little bit stunned right now. It's very quiet over here on the sidelines, but their sophomore quarterback, Trent Hurley, is walking back and forth slowly, methodically, not saying much, just clapping his hands, saying, guys, come on, let's go, making minor adjustments. But again, a little bit of a stunned feeling down here. Back to you. All right, thank you very much. And this 
one stat that the Blue Hens kind of hang their hat on is when they score first, they are almost perfect. And here they are giving up two long drives. The Hornets have really maintained the ball all but for about a minute and a half and only three and out, Horn three and out Blue Hens unable to make anything happen. And here they are in a second and 10 now from the 29. Empty backfield for Elko. And he's going to call a timeout. Did not like the alignment, so Delaware State burns two timeouts in the first quarter. Well, the play clock was coming down, so he had to call that timeout. 440 remaining. No score with the Route 1 rivalry well in play with the winner taking home the first state cup. There's a storm brewing on the horizon and one brewing in Delaware Stadium as the Hornets have really controlled this game with 440 to play in the first quarter. The Hornets have owned the entire time of possession except for one three and out by the Blue Hens. And here they are driving once again, second down and 10, ball at the 29 of Delaware. <laughs> Nick Elko out of the gun. Looking left, drops it down below, has his big tight end, number 81, Ryan Langdon, in a well-read play by the defense. Paul Warlow, number 10, there to make the stop. Great recognition by Paul Warlow on the middle tight end screen right there. The coaches couldn't possibly have more praise for Paul Warlow, calling him by far the best player on the Delaware defense. There are many scouts here today, including Raleigh McKenzie from the Oakland Raiders, checking out number 10. Third down and seven. Ball at the 26, empty backfield. Nick Elko out of the shotgun. Looking left, now comes back right and buys some time. Has a man wide open, tipped in the air, picked off. Ricky Tunstall with the ball. Tunstall electric when he has it in open field. Cuts it back to the inside, plenty of blockers, and Tunstall's gonna take it the distance. The Hornets were threatening, and the Blue Hens score. Well, you got to give a lot of credit to number 91, David Tinsley, for applying the pressure, but that is a 95-yard interception pick six. Somebody get Ricky Tunstall an oxygen mask. You see the ball bounce up. Now watch the escort and the blockers he has in front of him. They do a good job of not getting a penalty. So often in those situations, Todd, what happens is, is there's a guy on defense doesn't really know how to block, and he clips. None of the Blue Hens did that. Extra point attempt up and good. Sean Boehner kicks it through. So when it looked like Delaware State was controlling this thing from top to bottom, it's a defensive play by their man, Ricky Tunstall, taking it all the way back. They call him the most athletic player on the field, and he has turned the tables on the Hornets. The Blue Hens strike first. So much of this game is how you respond. Just to give you an idea of how much Delaware State has controlled this game, last year they had 112 total yards of offense. Right now they're sitting on 122. They have controlled this game offensively, but you have one big play by the defense of the Blue Hens, and it turns things around. Well, and that's what Delaware did last week against Westchester. They were not able to slow the Division II Rams, but it was the four turnovers that allowed Delaware to win that game. They get their first turnover here today. We'll see how Delaware State reacts because they're a lot further right. along, Todd, than they were last year. They are a much better team under Coach Kirby Blunt. Delaware State has visited the red zone twice in the first quarter. 0 for 2, a blocked kick and an interception, pick 6. And the Blue Hens now on top, 7-0 with 3.39 to play here in the opening quarter. Sean Boehner set to kick it off back deep for the Hornets. It'll be Tarpley and 25, Malcolm Williams. And Williams having a problem there. Decides to pick it up, cuts back up field, and he'll take it out to about the 15-yard line. And that is where Nick Elko and the offense will start. Let's go back and look at that turnover that really turned the tables on the Hornets. Well, I'll tell you exactly why this happened. Anytime you throw the ball late and high over the middle, bad things happen. And that's exactly what happened. Timmy Breaker gets his hand on the ball. A lot of blue shirts. Tunstall almost gets tripped right there. And then you see him take it the distance. Usually, 
when you get to the offensive lineman, they're not tackling a DB. I, I've been there too many times. <laughs> it's just never happened. He said he's the best athlete on the team. He wanted to show us. We had a chance to visit with Ricky last night, and they are playing him in somewhat of a hybrid position where he's going to drop down, play the line. He said, I'm playing a little Palomalu, referring to Pittsburgh Steeler great Troy Palomalu. And he said he likes the feel of that. He's going to make it his own. On the first and ten, no running room there for a Dehong Chong. And speaking of the Steelers, you'll see them Sunday night on NBC against Peyton Manning and the Denver Broncos. Nothing running there as Lath Walschlager and Paul Worlow team up to make the stop and actually lose about a half a yard. Yeah, we'll see how both teams react to that big play. You know, college football, even more than the NFL, it's such a game of emotion. And you can just see that that interception return by Tunstall kind of got the Blue Hens going. No question about it. Second down and 10 out of the gun. Here's new formation the Hornets are showing. Swinging out of the backfield. Got to be very careful here. Finds his man. It's Malcolm Williams. And Williams tackled at the 21 by Tim Breaker. But there's a flag on the play. Yep, and it's, it's going to go against number 65. Jadira Green for a high low block and you see Jeff Williams down the ground the Blue Hens can ill afford to lose yet another linebacker he was tied up with Travis Tarpley and then in from the side came Jadira Green let's hope he's okay personal foul number 65 and number five in the offense drop block half the distance to the goal second down Michael Roach our referee today and there you see is Ross pointed out Jeff Williams, a true freshman from Freeport, New York. Yeah, take a look at the left side of your screen. Travis Tarpley right there is on number 57, mm. and then in comes Jadira Green. I'm not exactly sure what he was doing there, it, almost like he lost his footing, because that is not how it's taught. And you cannot go low on a defender who's already engaged, who is already yeah. engaged like Williams was. And Green, not the smallest of fellas, 6'4", 300 pounds, coming down on the ankle of Jeff Williams. Good to see him up and walking. But as you mentioned, Ross, four of their six linebackers, their starting three other than Warlow, are on the sideline, some of them for the year. Yep, and you can make the argument that this is the position that they could least afford another injury. Delaware State has actually pulled Green from the game. I don't know if it's just for a play or more, but you see number 70 in there right now, Tyler Loomis replacing Green after the penalty. Second down and 17, now with the ball resting at the eight. Inside running a nice job there by number 25, Malcolm Williams, and he's ridden down to the ground by Paul Warlow, number 10. That's exactly what you're looking for on second and 17. Obviously, you're not going to get it all back, but if you get into a third down situation that's somewhat manageable, you see the inside counter play up into the hole, and Williams just goes right down the middle of the field. Not bad for a former high school quarterback. Third and 10, and the ball resting at the 15. Delaware State being very conservative down here at the end of the field. Elko looks downfield, checks down below, finds Williams once again. And the minute he turns to make his move upfield, Quincy Barr, the senior from Brandon, Florida, is there to take him down. Well, and that's why you want to get the opposing offense in third and long. Delaware was able to only rush three and sit back in a very soft zone. Elko had nothing to do other than to check it down. And then Barr and company were able to rally to the football. So a three and out for Delaware State after having two great opening drives here. We're down to the final 96 seconds of the first quarter, and the Hornets will have to punt it away. Marco Cano handles the low snap. The young man from Germany boots this one away. He's got the win at his back, and he drives his man all the way back. Rob Jones gets cut down about the 33-yard line as the Hornets come in. The ball trickles out of bounds. So good coverage by the Hornets, and the Blue Hens will get the ball for only the second time on offense, but they lead 7-0. Route 1 rivalry. Back in Newark, Delaware, temperature 84 degrees, scattered thunderstorms, and we do have a scenario in place if it does come our way because there is some threatening weather just to our northwest. For more on that, we check in down on the field with Carolyn Manum. Well, Todd, as you can see, the skies have gotten very dark and it's cooled off. What has happened is they've issued a warning to the crowd, which means there's been a lightning strike within a 30-mile radius of the stadium. If it gets to within a 10-mile radius, they're going to evacuate everybody out of the stadium, and they have to wait for no lightning between a period of 30 minutes within that 10-mile range before they continue play, and then we'll have a 20-minute warm-up. But for now, just a warning, although this weather is coming in pretty quick. Todd? 
All right, thank you very much, Carolyn. And as we started the game, the winds were very calm. It was very hot and humid, and you can tell right now the winds have shifted exactly the opposite direction. The temperature has come down, thankfully, but with that, some thunder and lightning in the area. For now, we play on first and 10 from the 30, Blue Hens, and their second time with the ball offensively, and they hand it off to their man number 30, Andrew Pierce, the junior, from Bridgeton, New Jersey, taken down by 95, Rodney Gunter. Rodney Gunter is one impressive young defensive lineman. <laughs> for the Delaware State Hornets. He was fifth on the team in tackles last year as a true freshman. Look at him. He's fired up. He knows this is a big opportunity for himself. 6'5", 300-pounder out there playing that right end position. Second down and 10, no gain on the carry. Hornets show blitz. Rob Jones, the receiver, brings it in. Nick Williams on the coverage. A nice pickup of about seven yards. The guys on offense for Delaware they probably are out of sync right now. I mean, they haven't really been on the field very much. It's been two long drives by Delaware State, and they just had the ball for a little bit on the third drive. They're not even really getting the chance to get into a rhythm yet. And this will probably be the final play of the first quarter. Again, Delaware just on their second offensive possession. The first one, a three and out. They got their points by way of a Ricky Tunstall. Pick six for 95 yards as the final seconds tick away here. Hurley out of the shotgun. Early looking deep, has his man, takes a big shot, catches made, and at the end of the first quarter, Rob Jones hauls it in. He was covered by Nick Williams and Devon Moore, but he brings it down inside Hornet territory. That is just a big time play by Rob Jones because he was well covered, and Hurley was hit as he threw it, going against the number one corner for Delaware State. Jones not only catches it, but stays in bounds. A 25-yard pickup for the Blue Hens as the first quarter comes to a conclusion. We played one. It's the Blue Hens on top, 7-0 over the Hornets. There's linebacker Jeff Williams, the true freshman on the sideline, going through a battery of tests. For more on him, we check in with Carolyn Mano. Yeah, Todd, the team says he suffered just a right ankle injury minor and that his return is probable. They took off his cleat, they wrapped it up, and now, as you can see, he's moving around pretty well on the sideline. So he is likely to come back, Todd. All right, thank you very much, Carolyn. As we get set to start the second quarter, weather threatening in the area. 7-0 Delaware on top of Delaware State by way of a 95-yard Ricky Tunstall pick six. Up until that point, Delaware State's offense really controlling the clock and the play on the field, and now Delaware has got their second possession of the ball game on the offensive side and they are driving on a first and ten from the 38. And that ball almost picked off and then almost knocked loose. A great job by Stephen Clark to hold on to it after Joe Boyd and Nick Williams came up and really rattled his feelings. Very fortunate is Trent Hurley that that ball wasn't intercepted. And thus far the Delaware offensive line has their hands full with this Delaware State defensive line. Hurley is getting hit almost every throw. Remember, this Delaware offensive line, very inexperienced. Right tackle Brandon Heath, really the only returning starter. Second down and three. They go back to the running game, and Andrew Pierce, as we introduce you to the starting lineups for the Blue Hands, and there is exactly what Ross was talking about. Earl Ladson really leads them with experience, and the backs and receivers, Nick Boyle, they like that tight end. Rob Jones, a big playmaker for the offense, and quarterback Trent Hurley. First down and 10, they move the chains. That takes them down to the 24. Now, when they get inside the 20, they don't like to call it the red zone because that's the universal sign for stop. So they call it the green zone. That's from Jim Hoffer, the offensive coordinator, not me. Man wide open in the seam. Does a great job, does Stephen Clark, finding the soft spot before Boyd and Moore team up to bring him down. But a nice pickup there by the Hens. Yep, and Delaware's going right back on the football. They like to get lined up, and every once in a while, they go to the hurry up to try to catch the defense off guard. Rodney Gunter applying the pressure to the quarterback. They'll go back to the running game. This is Pierce. Pierce off the right-hand side. Touchdown, Delaware. But there is a flag on the play coming out of the backfield. Holding number 79 of the offense. It's a 10-yard penalty. First down. So Nick Catalico, the junior, 
at a, from Del Rand, New Jersey, the guilty party. Yeah, take a look at him. The big right guard, 79. That right hand is outside. When the right hand's outside like that, they're going to call that. That is absolutely a hold. They will call that 10 times out of 10. If you find your hand outside like that as an offensive lineman, you got to replace it. Sometimes, Todd, they'll let you do that initially, but then you got to replace it and bring it inside. You can't just leave it out there and torque a guy like that. So that'll back it up to the 17. Take the touchdown off the board by Andrew Pierce. First and 17 from the 17, and another flag comes flying. This one coming from the line judge, George Bansaw makes the tackle. Offsides, number 91 of the defense. It's a five yard penalty, first down. Olushigan Iambiola likes to go by Olu, thank you very much. He's the guilty party for the Hornets. Yeah, and the shame of it, Todd, just get back to the previous play for Delaware is that Nick Catalico, he didn't need to do that. I mean, he's 345 pounds up on a linebacker. All he needs to do is get a good shot on the guy, and Pierce would have been able to score. Another flag, so three plays, three flags. It's early in the season, but uh, the coaches will say there's a no excuse for that, and it's going to be a false start, I think, this time on the Blue Hens. For the snap, false start, number 21 of the offense. It's a five-yard penalty, first down. Stephen Clark now in the doghouse of head coach Casey Keeler. Is that backs them up again? Well, and there's never any excuse to go off sides, especially on offense. But when you're a wide receiver, you're just looking at the football anyway. I mean, and he was on the back side of a run to the right. So that'll take him back to the 17-yard line. 13.04 to play here in the first half. It's the Blue Hens on top of the Hornets, 7-0. Pierce off the right-hand side. He's got some running room, has to cut it in. The red helmets surround him. It's Iambiola, the first man there to make the stop. Sports also helping him. You know, it's going to be really interesting to watch Pierce this year because the first couple of years, obviously, went over 3,000 yards, but their offensive line, Todd, was so good. Right. I mean, Gino Gradkowski was a fourth-round pick by the Baltimore Ravens. Shea Allard, as well, got signed by the Green Bay Packers. They had a veteran group, so Pierce had a lot of big holes. This year, it's going to be a little bit more tough sledding. Second down and 14. Early looking left, pressure coming, goes across the middle. Beautiful catch, touchdown, Michael Johnson in the hands. That was a big-time throw by Trent Hurley to Johnson, the sophomore, out of Gainesville, Florida. Watch Johnson. He just runs a post, and Hurley throws a high. Johnson goes up and gets it, and Delaware is on the board again. Sean Boehner in for the extra point. He drives it through the uprights, and it's blue hands at 14. Hornets nothing. So after two great opening drives by the Hornets, they come away with nothing, and it's the blue hands that out in front by 14. The battle is on. This is the Route 1 rivalry. Trent Hurley's got the offense moving. We'll be back to Raven Field here at Delaware Stadium after this short break. Trent Hurley, the sophomore from Pennsylvania, the transfer from Bowling Green, leads the Blue Hands on a nine-play, four-minute drive, covering 70 yards and just three first downs. Yeah, and he's the latest in a long line of transfer quarterbacks here. We all know about Joe Flacco, one of the top ten quarterbacks in the NFL. Pat Devlin, really the star of the HBO series, Hard Knocks. Trent Hurley is the latest one. I mean, with the lineup of transfer quarterbacks they have, who wouldn't want to transfer and play quarterback for the Blue Hens? I want to transfer and play quarterback for Delaware. 12-17 to play here in the first half, the second week of college football. Trent Hurley's numbers on the day, not gaudy, not that impressive, but he has managed it. He told us last night, ball security is job one for me. Well, and he had to come in and win the job, and he really didn't do it till after their second scrimmage during the preseason camp here. Had to beat out two quarterbacks for Delaware that had starting experience. 
Boehner kicks it away. This one will be returned up the middle. That has been the kind of second quarter for the Hornets as Williams ran right over the back of Travis Tarpley. Flag on the play as he was taken down by his own man at the 15. Nine times out of ten, this is a block in the back. It's almost like clockwork. Illegal block in the back. Number 44, the return team. After this, is to the goal line. Break down. David Moore, the guilty party for the Hornets, that will back them up even further into their own territory. And this is where the Hornets need one of those patented opening quarter drives when they held on the ball for five or six minutes, cover 70 yards. they got to give their defense a, a breath. I mean, this is a crazy game so far, Todd. Uh, you feel like Delaware State has totally dominated the action for the most part, and they're losing 14-0. I wonder whether or not they're getting discouraged because they're moving the ball so well. The defense has played fairly well. But yet the turnovers and some of the other miscues have gotten them in this hole. First and ten, the ball at the five. I formation for the Hornets. Ball security time now. They'll run it right up the middle with number 34, Najee Jackson, the freshman from Gainesville, Virginia, taken down by number 32, Kyle Gale. Delaware State is really diverse on offense. Yeah. You know, they will, they'll spread things out and throw the ball all over the lot with Nick Elko. That time, got into a power formation. They're just in a pro set right now. Tight end, lead fullback, they're coming at you. Hey, Delaware just as well. They put six men now up on the line. Yep, Elko changed the play because he sees pressure. Gonna be a quick pass. Had Tarpley on the right-hand side, just couldn't get it to him. Travis Hawkins was manning up with number five. Travis Tarpley, the senior from Danville, Virginia. You know, it's still early in this game time, but this is a pretty critical third down yep. in my book because third and three, which is very manageable for Nick Elko, but if they don't get this, they're going to have to punt the ball to Delaware into the wind, mm -hmm. and Delaware should get fantastic field position. So after having a double trip into the red zone, the Hornets have come away with no points, a blocked field goal and a pick six. Pass was picked off at the five-yard line and returned by Ricky Tunstall in the first quarter, and that's how Delaware got on the board first. And now, as Ross pointed out, Delaware stayed in a very precarious situation. A third down and three with the ball at the 12-yard line, and Delaware State takes their third timeout. We'll be back to see what they can do when we return to Newark. Chasing Netflix. Head coach Kermit Blunt in his second season as the head coach at Delaware State after 16 years at Winston-Salem Winston -Salem, excuse me, State University also played there as a quarterback. But right now, he's trying to figure out how to get his offense back on track. Third and three from the 12-yard line. Unique formation here. Two tailbacks in the backfield to his left. Tarpley in motion. And the pitch out, cuts it back inside, well read by the hands, and the first man there is Paul Warlow. But the play was really made by Jake Justy, getting outside and forcing the runner back inside. Watch Justy, the left side of your screen. He does not let Chong get outside, forces him back into Warlow, who cleans up there. Interesting play call by Delaware State, given the success they've had in the air. Gap sound, uh, the blue hands on that stand as Marco Cano once again on to kick it away. One foot in his own end zone, boots this one away into the win, and that thing just stands straight up. Fair catch made at 43-yard line. So the blue hands with 10.47 to play here in the first half and a 14-0 lead looking very good as they get set to roll out their quarterback, Trent Hurley, who has been harassed this game. Yeah, take a look at the shots that he's taken. Almost every time he delivers the football, he's getting hit. A lot of times it's Rodney Gunner. But you know what we didn't see on that video? All three of those were completions, which means he's getting it done even though it's a very inexperienced offensive line in front of him. He's growing before our very eyes. David Hayes has now checked into the game, number 28, the senior from Havel, New Jersey. And Hayes gets the call, goes right up the middle, down to the 38, and we check in with Carolyn. 
guys, Trent Hurley is not an emotional or fiery quarterback. He's very mellow on the sidelines, but he was spending a lot of time talking to backup quarterback Tim Donnelly, and he said that's one of the guys who's made his transition a lot easier. Even though he's fighting for playing time at the beginning of the season with the backup quarterbacks, they still are all very friendly, helping each other out and talking to each other during plays. Todd? That's one thing that head coach Casey Keeler mentioned to us, that the guys uh, really work together. And they've embraced the fact that Hurley won the job, and they have to be ready. Once again, Hurley gets hit as he releases. He was looking for number five, Rob Jones, but it was Herman Hinton, number 33, the senior from Philadelphia, that applied the pressure. Yeah, you, you just can't allow a guy to run right in the A-gap. J.D. Zerko, the left guard there, did not have highs for the safety. When you're an offensive lineman, you always protect inside first, then outside. The A-gaps on either side of the center take priority because if someone comes off the edge, it'll take them longer to get there. So after the incomplete, it is a third and six with the ball at the 39. Elko comes back to the inside. Great coverage. Ball squirts loose. Andrew Pierce made the catch. The line judge comes in and says incomplete. And it was Jermon Colston, number 24, there on the coverage. Great play by the Hornets. Yeah, they put Pierce out wide, wanting to get the ball in his hands. It's just a wide receiver screen to the running back. You see the right of your screen, the offensive lineman get out in front. But Pierce never had a shot. So that'll bring up a fourth down punting situation for the Blue Hens. Raleigh Zaragoza, now remember, he can rugby right, he can rugby left, or he can go the old traditional way. He's going to rugby left this time. And he's going to hold on to it. Zaragoza gets the first down and wisely steps out of bounds at the 30-yard line. And sometimes when you watch college football games, you say, why do they do that rugby-style punt? This is one of the reasons, because it puts pressure on the other team. And Delaware State still had their starting defense in there. Zaragoza showing some athleticism and good blocking in front of him. That was well-designed. The senior from Azusa, California, with a great special teams play. So a blocked field goal attempt, and now the fake punt has the Blue Hens once again in great position. The ball resting at the 30. It's a first and 10. Fakes to Pierce, inside man, no one there to cover him, and he's cut down at the five. Once again, it's Nick Boyle, big man running free before Devon Moore finally brings him down. They're really high on Boyle, and he's just obviously uncovered. That's what they call a dropped coverage. Somebody was responsible for him. It's a mental error, and mental errors will get you beat because you can't allow a huge tight end like Boyle go running down the field unencumbered like that. They're going to mark it at the three, so that is a 27-yard pickup. Hurley lining up his receivers. Puts Milburn in motion. Up the middle, number 28, spinning to the outside. It looked for a moment there like David Hayes was going to get around the corner, but the Hornets do a great job of keeping him out, bringing him down for a small game. Yeah, they brought Milburn in motion to try to seal off the backside to make sure nobody from Delaware State was able to chase down the play from behind. But it was actually the front side where they got stuffed up. Number 27, Nick Williams, the senior from San Diego, there to make the stop. Second down and two. Hayes back up the middle, this time running into a whole bunch of white jerseys. He's not going to cross the line. Still looking for a mark. The line judge comes in and holds up the third down. So Aaron Richardson, number 52, the senior from Washington, D.C., there to make the stop. With everything we've discussed about the Delaware offensive line, don't you get the sense here that they're trying to send a message? I would be surprised if they put the ball in the air here. This is going to be a quarterback sneak or a quick dive. They want these guys to realize they can get it in. And Jake Geyser gives the signal to center, tapping his right hip as Trent Hurley came to the line, and Hurley follows the signal right off that big right hip, and he dives in for another touchdown for Delaware. And if you're going to run a quarterback sneak, running behind the 345-pound right guard is a pretty good idea. They want to try to get some confidence for this young, inexperienced offensive line. I wouldn't be surprised if they said to the guys in the huddle, hey, it's three straight runs here. We're scoring a touchdown on the ground. Sean Boehner on for the extra point. Drives it through, so we're 21-0 Delaware after a slow start by the hands. Here it is one more time. And just before that, Jake Geyser gave him the, hey, right here. 
and the quarterback follows suit. So Trent Hurley, the transfer from Bowling Green, coach called him a gamer. He's doing just that now. He's got the hands on top, 21-0. Back at Delaware Stadium every weekday morning, the NBC Sports Network brings you all of the night's sports highlights in just 20 minutes. Wake up and turn on the lights every weekday morning on the NBC Sports Network. The lights are on here, but the clouds are getting very, very dark. As Carolyn Mantle reported earlier, the rain is coming down. Now, these are blue hens and hornets. They're tough. They can handle this, Ross. What we're concerned about is if there's lightning within a 10-mile radius, then we have to bring everyone out of the stadium and turn the players back into the locker room. Yeah, we saw that a bunch in college football last year. I mean, some games went yeah. six and seven hours with some of the delays because of lightning. That drive by the hands, eight plays, 43 yards. They covered that distance in two minutes and 56 seconds. And for Delaware State, it has really been a tale of two quarters. The first two drives, they had 22 plays, 122 yards. Since then, they've had six plays and 20 yards. Tarpley, he'll bring it out. Tarpley at the 20. Tarpley at the 30, spinning across to about the 34-yard line, and that may be the spark the Hornets needed. Well, and you can see right there why Tarpley's a guy they want to get the ball in his hands. Preseason, all MEAC. Set a Delaware State record for receptions last year. Led the entire league in all-purpose yards. Once he beats Milburn right there, the edge defender, there's nobody else out there. Sean Boehner has to help out, bringing him down to the turf. So it's a first and 10 now, a 34-yard return for Tarpley. And the ball at the 34. Now the question is, for the folks watching at home, has it been adjustments by Delaware's defense, or have the Hornets got away from... What did work so well for them in the first two series? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. Plenty of time by Elko. Dumps it down below. Finds Malcolm Williams. He takes a hard hit and a five-yard pickup. Well, and they've had some success running the football, Todd. But that's their best offense right. right there. Spreading things out. Trying to get the ball to Tarpley and Wilson. As you see, Travis Hawkins is down in the field. Travis Hawkins, the junior from Rockville, Maryland. The coaches all call him a special player. And... Interesting side note, the defensive secondary for Delaware, and this is a, an announcer at a spotter's dream, one, two, three, and four. And this is number one, Travis Hawkins. As we take a look at it one more time, he was involved in that tackle, a preseason first-team all-CAA player. Yeah, he comes in and delivers a really good mm. shot. That's a perfect form tackle. Yeah, I mean, that's his, his right shoulder right there. Taken down Malcolm Williams. That's exactly how they draw it up. Kept his head out of it. No speculation on injury. We do know, though, that number 57, Jeff Williams, who Carolyn Mano reported about earlier with the right ankle injury, he has returned and played a few snaps. This is not a good sign when you're one of your best corner men takes, looks like, a shoulder injury. So the junior from Rockville, Maryland, runs off under his own power. And this is the one area where they are pretty deep for the Blue Hens is that secondary. Very talented group back there. But thus far, going against Delaware State and their wide receivers, I don't think they want to miss any of those guys. We see the adjustment. They put Ricky Tunstall, <laughs> number four, at corner. Craig Brodsky, the true freshman, number 43, from Orange Park, Florida, now in at safety. Nowhere to go for Nick Elko as the pocket collapsed and he was looking downfield, so great coverage. Vince Hollerman, the freshman from Woodbine, Georgia, number 59, the first man to get to him. Well, look, he couldn't find anybody, but he could have just stayed in the pocket. I mean, sometimes you get a little anxious. Quarterbacks have a mental clock in their head, but he was fine if he just stayed where he was. If anything, he could have came to the near side, gone to his left. Big third down, third and eight from the 36. Hornets trying to keep this drive alive. Elko looking to his left, now comes back to his right, dumps it down low. And you got to question that from the quarterback's perspective. He is a senior, Patrick Callaway, there in the stop. You need eight. Why do you drop it down and only pick up four or five? Well, you do that when there's nobody downfield that you feel like you can get the ball to. 
and you hope that maybe Malcolm Williams can make a guy or two miss and get the first down. You see him discussing it with his coach right there. Offensive coordinator, Arrington Jones for the Hornets, talking with his quarterback. You know, that sack was the first sack of the year for Delaware. So their defense getting warmed up here with 6.04 to play in the first half. Short snap, problem handling, and here come the pins. Lucky to get that one away. Flag on the play, and the Hornets will down it at about the 38, but that has got to be the best case scenario as Marco Kano, the young man from Germany, somehow gets that one away. He had five blue jerseys in his face. The punters might be the star of the game so far. Personal foul, roughing the kicker on the defense. 15 yard penalty. First down. Just how they planted if you're the Hornets. Take a look at it again. The ball's on the ground, goes right between his legs. He finally gets it and gets it off. Mm. Walshlager gets just a little piece of him. Well, I don't know about that. And you can see Casey Keeler's not happy on the sideline. So the Hornets now, instead of punting it away and putting their defense back on the field with 551, new life for them as they try to get on the board. They trail 21-0. It's now a first and 10 from a 43 of the Hens. Elko comes out firing, looking, has his man on the side. Beautiful cut back to the inside. And Josh Bailey makes the reception, picks up eight more yards. Tim Breaker there on the stop. This looks more like the Hornets we yes. saw on the first two drives. Yep, this was the first two drives. Spreading it out. They've had all kinds of time to throw. I mean, I think we can probably count on one hand the amount of times the Delaware Blue Hens have brought more than three pass rushers. Second down and two now from the 35. Elko will go under center. I formation. Going to the power game right up the middle. 34 is Najee Jackson, the freshman from Gainesville, Virginia. And he'll pick up yardage for the first down. Stopped by 46, Leith Walshlager. Delaware State, if you're not familiar with them, they are from Dover, Delaware. They're the Hornets, and they come to us by way of the MEAC. They open up the 2012 campaign with a victory over VMI, 17-10 last week, as Nick Elko ran it in four yards with 45 seconds left in the game to get the victory for head coach Kermit Blunt in his second season. Travis Hawkins has returned to the game for the Blue Hens. He was shaking up two plays ago. Elko now nowhere to go, and the hesitation absolutely killed him. Jeff Williams, Jake Justy there on the spot for the big sack. Jeff Williams also there, and that's a huge loss. Yeah, one of the first times today Nick Rapone has dialed up pressure. He had blitzers off of both edges, and Nick Elko did not see it. That, that was fairly obvious when you saw Justin Williams walk up on both sides. Play action passes are not going to do well against pressure off the edge. Najee Jackson, the tailback there, just a true freshman. He was looking for someone to block, couldn't decide and let both guys go. So second down and 20 now. Malcolm Williams back into the game at running back. Elko scrambling to his right, has time, goes downfield and a beautiful grab. Justin Bruton with a one-hander. Put that on your top ten. Bruton is one impressive player. Elko again leaks out to his right. Watch this catch. Just sticks his right hand in there. We'll take another better look at it behind the pole there. Watch, watch this. Just spins out around Hawkins. That is a fantastic catch. Big paw. Put it up there. Bring it in. Both feet. Nice. First and ten now. Back to the running game. Pick up four more yards. Jake Justy making the stop on Malcolm Williams. So a balanced attack coming from the Hornets now with 332. And you go back to that roughing the kicker penalty. Instead of possibly going up 24-28-0, the Blue Hens are now looking at the Hornets maybe going into halftime at 21-7. Which would be a gigantic difference. Remember, this is a team that was down 35 to nothing at halftime last year. So if nothing else, It'd be a moral victory, and it would allow them 
to stay in the game for the second half. Here's the formation they used just once in the first quarter. This time they'll go to the slant pass. Has his man. Beautiful play. Touchdown, Justin Wilson. And the Hornets are on the board. Elko spotted the man-to-man -man coverage to his left. Just a quick slant. Burley got beat at the line of scrimmage by Wilson. At this level, that's relatively easy. And you go back to the roughing the kicker penalty that gave the ball back to the Hornets, and they turn it into six points, so they are on the board with 3.02 to play here in the first half. Mitchell Ward on for the extra point. It is good, 21-7 here at the Route 1 rivalry. And that is the Hornets squad we saw in the first two possessions as they came out, methodically went down, but unable to convert. This time, Justin Wilson hooks up with Nick Elko for the six. The first state cup is on the line here at Delaware Stadium. It's the Blue Hands of Delaware and the Hornets of Delaware State. That's Justin Wilson, the senior from Windsor, Connecticut, who just connected with his quarterback, Nick Elko, for the strike to get the Hornets on the board. 21-7, 3-0-2 to play, and it was all set up really by a special teams play that went awry, the roughing the kicker play on the Blue Hens. Yeah, special teams have had a really big impact on this game so far. Had a blocked field goal earlier that we haven't even been talking about. So Ward set to kick it away for the Hornets as they get their first points since 2009 in this rivalry as they were shut out last year. Short kick taken at about the 13-yard line. And it's number one, Travis Hawkins, the man who's injured with his shoulder. He'll take it out to the 30. As we go back to that last drive, it looked like the Hornets were going to stall out. They got to put it away. Bad snap. And then this happens. Yeah, when can something that goes bad actually go good? Right then. A bad snap led to the penalty on Walschlager, which led to the unbelievable catch by Bruton. And then Elko just finding Wilson against man-to-man -man coverage on the quick slam. So the Hornets back in at 21-7, looking more like the Delaware State team we saw in their opening two series before they gave up a blocked field goal attempt and the pick six for 95 yards. This time, Trent Hurley hands it off. Ernest Ajay, we mentioned his name for the first time, the senior from Woodbridge, Virginia, teaming up with Chizeki Ukeji on the stop. Yeah, Ajay is their leading and returning tackler from last year. Had two and a half tackles for loss last week against VMI. Second down and seven from the 34. Hurley finds his man on the outside, number 31, the freshman Jarrell Harrison out of Richmond, Virginia. Special team player of the week, head coach Casey Keeler, very big on practice players and special team players. I thought that was really cool. Very Talking cool. with Casey, actually, those are the only two things they honor during the week. Special teams player of the week from the game before and practice player of the week. First and 10 from the 42. Hurley going back to work, looking left, looking right, decides to tuck it, goes up the middle, stays upright, gets to midfield, and uh, Ross, as a coach, that's probably something we want to tell your guy, you might want to get down because those red helmets are coming in a bad mood. Yep, and, and that is the reason why Trent Hurley's their quarterback. I mean, they're, they're, he was in a competition with both Donnelly and Spacek, but his mobility, his ability to make plays with his feet is the reason why he got the starting nod. Injured player on the field for Delaware State at midfield. And one of their defensive linemen down on the ground as they'll take a look at him. 21-7, a minute 47 to play. If you thought the Hens were going to maybe just go to the running game and run the clock out, think again as big number 93, George Bansaw, the junior from Woodbridge, Virginia, up and walking off the field. Take a look at him as he goes to make the tackle. Right in the middle of your screen, number 93. Really tough to tell there, obviously. Second down and two, Second down and two from the 50. Pierce does a great job of bouncing at the outside, gets across. They'll mark him down at the 49, but Quentin Forts and Ernest Ajay there to team up and make the stop. 
Delaware is going to a little bit of a hurry up, but it's not exactly a two minute offense where Hurley's calling the plays. He's still looking to the sideline. Looks like it'll be a quarterback sneak here. Big Trent Hurley, all 6'4", 220 pounds of him, just bowls forward, and he'll pick up the first down. And remember, in college football, you have a little bit more time in these situations because the clock stops with every first down until they set the chains. Empty backfield. Hurley looks left, comes back right, has his man, number five, Rob Jones. Jones across the 40 to 39, and a flag comes out of the backfield. Jermon Colston there to make the stop, but once again, flag on the play. Before the pass, personal foul, number 24 on the defense. It's a 15-yard penalty, first down. And Coach Blunt saying, what was the foul and what was the number again? Because I want to get a hold of him. Jermon Colston, number 24, the junior from Norfolk, Virginia, called for the personal foul, and that is huge. Well, and typically, the referee will give you a little bit more of an explanation than that, whether it's a hand to the face or whatever the case might be, because he said before the pass. There are only so many things it can be. And what we do know, it's going to mark off 15 yards. It'll take it all the way down to the 32 and a first down. So they were at the 47. They're now at the 32. And head coach Blunt is still saying, give me a better explanation. Yeah, what did he do? I want to know too, coach. Four receivers set for the hands. Hurley looking deep. Has his man over, shoots him, and he takes a pop. Devon Moore, and the flag comes out. Helmet comes flying off of Rob Jones. Well, they said Moore was their big hitter, and he delivered right there. Rob Jones bounced right back up. They're having a discussion. Targeting the head or neck area is a point of emphasis this year in college football. You see Moore fly in there. And you agree with the call? Well, i got to take another look at it. Obviously, when the helmet comes off, much like the NFL, when in doubt, they're going to throw the flag. We'll get the word from our referee, Michael Roach, but as you pointed out, the helmet comes off. That does mean one thing for sure. Rob Jones has to come off the field for at least one play. Unless there's a penalty. He can stay on if there's a penalty. It's kind of a quirky new rule. Right. But it looks like he's off the field regardless. Personal foul, number 44 in the defense. Unnecessary roughness. It's a 15-yard penalty from the prior spot. Automatic first down. Let's take another look at it. Oh, man, I don't know about that. It looks like he had his shoulder right in the chest. I don't see a targeting of the head or neck area. One more time. Rob Jones saw the hit coming. You see him looking yeah. over there. I got to tell you, it was a very violent collision, Todd, but I think that was a legal hit. I think the helmet coming off and his head snapping back made the officials think that it was a head or neck hit. Timeout on the field as Kermit Blunt is still working the side judge, trying to get a better explanation. 51 seconds to play, first and 10 from the 17. Let's look at it one more time and say, now remember, you can't target the head and you can't go after a defenseless player, but right. I, I'm, I'm kind of with you. It's a violent hit and the helmet popping off probably makes it even worse. But was that worth 15 yards? No, that, that, that is to me not a penalty. That is shoulder in chest. Now, was it violent? Yes. But this, look, this is a violent sport, okay? There are going to be hits like that. To me, watching more there, it almost looks to me, Todd, like he was trying to deliver a blow that he knew would be legal. You know, otherwise, you see back in the day, guys would go right, right. helmet to helmet. Take that wasn't off. helmet to helmet. That was shoulder to chest. And I applaud more for that hit. I think that's the wrong call. And Rob Jones, to his credit, I always tell kids, you really want to take away the severity of a good hit, just pop right back up and walk away like it was nothing. And that's exactly what he did. Yeah, he is one tough guy. <laughs> his teammate told us yesterday, he's pretty much crazy. I mean, you know, he, he's aggressive all day long. He's going to come at you. 51 seconds to play, 21-7. It's a first and 10 from the 17. Hurley rolling to his right. Pressure coming. Gets a big hit. 
And no flag thrown there. They go right back to Rob Jones and Jermon Colston, who were doing a little bit of hand fighting up there, but the flag did not come out. Watch Hurley take another shot from the backside. Oh. Hurley going on field goal. Boy, he really landed hard right there. Well, the Hornets are getting their money's worth as big number 91, Olushigan Ayambiola, a senior out of Maryland, came in and shot him in from the backside. 45 seconds now on second down. They'll go inside. Andrew Pierce, a crafty piece of running here. Pierce gets taken down finally at the 13, and a nice run by him. And it's getting a little chippy down there between the red and white and the blue and gold. Delaware calls timeout. Jermon Colston there to make the stop on Andrew Pierce. 38.3 seconds to play here in the first half. It's a third and five. The hands on top of the Hornets, 21 to seven. I want to remind you, coming up at the half, it's the Geico Halftime Show with Liam McHugh, Doug Flutie, and Heinz Ward. Love scores and highlights, plus preview of football night in America. All that coming up on the Halftime Show. Great day in college football still to go, of course, out on the West Coast on the NBC Sports Network. You'll see San Diego State and Army. And before we get back to the field of play, let's check in on the field with Carolyn Mano. Well, you guys mentioned the chippiness down here, and Casey Keeler was yelling at Rob Jones after that hit when he came up the sidelines. He said, shut your mouth, shut your mouth. He's preaching everybody to calm down, doesn't want them to get in further trouble. Todd? Well, no question about it. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, the players are starting to get a little extra shot here and there. And, and, and Ross, you know they always catch the second guy, so you may be John, and a guy may take a shot at you, but do not, I mean, do not retaliate. No, that's why I like to be in the first. <laughs> 38 seconds to play. The man from Princeton calls it 21-7 on a third and five. Hurley back looking left. Pumps it once, pulls it back in. He's got some room to run. Defense comes up, and he's going to take a big shot at about the seven, but it looks like enough yardage for a first down. Yep, and you can see Casey Keeler telling him to spike it. They want to keep that last time out in case they get tackled in the field of play. He'll spike it here to clock the ball. So it's a first and goal at the six. He spikes it now with 26 seconds to play. That'll give them three downs to play with no timeouts for the Blue Hands. And look at this, look at this one more time. Trent Hurley, you mentioned it, a physical kid. He doesn't mind, he's a gamer, doesn't mind going after the after the defense. Now he wanted to throw that ball right there. I'm, I'm surprised he was able to keep it like that. Then you see him take the shot at the end there. All right, 26 seconds to play. Ross, you've been in the trenches before. What are you calling here? Well, you're going to throw the ball, and you're going to throw it into the end zone, but you still do have that one timeout in your back pocket. You don't want to have to use it, however. Delaware State cannot stop the clock. Hurley with a bullet to the inside, and once again, it's Jones who gets absolutely hammered. Joe Boyd this time does the honors. The junior from Fort Washington, Maryland, comes across and meets up with number five. Yep, and that was a little bit of a pick play right there, or as the offense would say, a rub route. Jones was open. That was a poor throw by Hurley, who has to come off the field because his helmet came off. Watch the end of this play. You saw Jones there. He was open, and that was a poor throw by Hurley, and then Hurley's helmet comes off, so he has to come off the field. And you cannot allow Hurley to stay on the field by calling a timeout. In other words, that helmet comes off and there's no penalty. He has to come off the field. You can't call a timeout to try to keep Hurley on the field. New rule this year. So with 22 seconds to play in the first half, it's 21-7, Delaware on top. Hurley, the starting quarterback, has to come out. Tim Donnelly, 6'4", senior from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, comes in. Meanwhile, Rob Jones is being tended to by the trainers. He has taken two big hits. And head coach Casey Keeler talked to us about Tim Donnelly. Great player, great teammate. All he wants to do is see his team win. Yep, he's a former walk-on, and he was the backup quarterback last year until Trevor Sason who's from Springford High School outside of Philadelphia, got hurt early. So Donnelly started a bunch of ball games for the Blue Hens last year. Had to be tough for him to get beat out during camp. But, you know, player, players understand. Yeah. As long as it's an open competition, they get it. And as Carolyn reported earlier, good friends with Trent Hurley, always encouraging him, telling him what he's missing and probably what he can do as he comes back on. But here's the situation. Donnelly has to replace Trent Hurley for at least one play as Hurley's helmet came off on the last hit. Yeah, and you see Rob Jones come off. Remember, they're without Nigel White today as well. Third they're, they're and number six. one wide receiver. 
So we'll see what Tim Donnelly can do. Here's an opportunity for him. Third and six now. Out of the gun. Donnelly looks left, comes back right, has his man, and not a bad way to come in. Touchdown, Blue Hens. You know, that is not easy. Kind of like the relief pitcher there, coming off the bench in third and six, throws a touchdown pass on a little crossing pattern. And now if you're Donnelly, you don't want to play again the rest of the year. <laughs> you got a great quarterback rating. Keep it you up. like it. One pass, one touchdown. Donnelly on for the hold, so his game has been pretty much perfect. Perfect hold, perfect pass, and it's 28-7, a 21-point margin once again for the Blue Hens. I love the big smile on Donnelly's face coming off the field. It started with good pass protection for Donnelly. He finds Harrison over the middle. Watch the finish here by Harrison. Watch this. Whap. Runs over the defender to get in the end zone. Otherwise, they would have had to call timeout. Watch Harrison deliver a blow to get in the end zone. He smelled it. The six foot, 205 pound freshman from Richmond, Virginia, Jarrell Harrison, the special teams player of the week in practice, gets himself a touchdown, and the Blue Hens have a 21 point lead with 17 seconds to play in the first half. Tim Donnelly comes in, the senior from Myrtle Beach. One play, one pass. That's a huge turn of events there at the end of the first half. Would have been a big difference if Delaware State could have gone in only down 21. 11 plays, 69 yards. They get it done in 2 minutes and 40 seconds. Got to be happy for Donnelly, right? I mean, no question. senior, he's a backup, gets to come in and contribute. That's awesome. Makes the weekend that much nicer. This one will go deep. They'll bring it out. Travis Tarpley, who had a 35-yard return on the last kickoff, decides to say, let's see if our offense can't get us into field goal range with 17 seconds to play. Now, remember, Delaware State out of timeouts as they burn through all three of them in the first quarter. Here we go, down 21 points. What do you do if your head coach, Kermit Blunt, and Nick Elko is your quarterback? Do you say, go out there and take a knee, and let's go in and talk about this? Yeah, with 17 seconds and no timeouts, you take a knee because it's too far for any sort of Hail Mary. And what you don't want is a turnover and give Delaware a chance for maybe at least a field goal attempt or more. Delaware puts Ricky Tunstall about 25 yards back just in case, and that's exactly what Nick Elko does. He'll take a knee and let the last 10 seconds run off the clock here at Delaware Stadium. The Route 1 rivalry has got one half in the books, and it was a very interesting first quarter with the Hornets dominating two trips to the red zone, coming away with no points after the 95-yard pick six by Ricky Tunstall really opened up the floodgates. And then on their last drive, they got their offense back on track to get their lone touchdown. Well, and you're right, and, and you hear it all the time, but the, the, the reality is Delaware State's right there in this game. We set it down on the field in Carolyn Mano. Coach, we saw it get very chippy and physical down here. Both Trent and Rob off to the sidelines. What do you know about them? I thought they are pretty good hits. Um, you know, we thought originally possibly they'd come high to the head on Trent, but they didn't. Um, I think Rob was smart enough to know when you're changing quarterbacks, we might need you to cramp up a little bit so we can get another quarterback out there. Got Timmy warmed up. Timmy came in and threw a, a really nice pass. The great thing about having a guy like Timmy is his poise. And you know you can put them right in and just run the offense and not worry about it. But you're not worried about those guys for the second half? No, not at all. They'll both be back. Defensively, that roughing the kicker penalty really gave them some momentum heading into halftime. Can you assess how your defense played this first half? Yeah, I mean, I think Delaware State executed very well. Um, and, and we just didn't do a good enough job getting pressure on the quarterback. And also, our corners have to challenge more. I mean, too many times we're pressing on one side, they're going back to the soft side. We said both of those corners need to press. So well, we need to challenge our corners to get up in their face and press a little bit more in the second half. Coach, thank you. Good luck in the second half, Todd. At halftime here at Delaware Stadium with the first state cup on the line, the Blue Hands lead the Hornets 28-7. Let's send it now to Liam McHugh in New York for that Geico Halftime Report. Back in Newark, Delaware, we are under a rain and weather situation right now. The stadium has been cleared. There is a storm in the area. 
And just as we went to the half and sent it back to our New York studios and Liam McHugh, the warning was given and the fans and everyone forced to leave the stadium and the players will stay in the locker room. Now, situation, there's a lot of scenarios in play as far as what lightning hits and how far out it is. But bottom line is it's all for the safety of the fans and the players as the rain continues to come down. And there's a situation where 10 miles out with a lightning strike, then they have to evacuate. And that's what we're under right now. So at the half here at this game, 28-7, it's Delaware on top of Delaware State. For more on the weather situation and the scenario that will play out, we set it down to Carolyn Mano. Todd, thank you. I'm here with the University of Delaware's Chief of Police, Patrick Ogden. And Chief, can you just tell us right now what the situation is? What do you know? Uh, in the command center, we're monitoring the weather. There's a band of thunderstorms that are coming through the area. Uh, so we're trying to err on the side of caution. This game is obviously important to the fans of the University of Delaware and Delaware State University and all the fans throughout the state. But uh, safety is paramount, and we're trying to err on the side of caution. Chief, we got two 30-minute warnings out there on the field. And from what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, those are the two different bands that you're talking about. So can you tell us anything about how many are passing through right now, how many more we could potentially expect? Uh, there's several bands uh, passing through the area. Um, so... What we're trying to do is we have rings set up around the city of Newark for 30 miles out and 10 miles out. So when we had the, uh, the, the lightning strikes that were within the 30-mile radius, we were putting out a warning to all the fans to let them know that they're in the area. And when they get within the 10-mile band, we're going ahead and evacuate. So that, that's what happened there at halftime. I know you have uh, multiple evacuations. Thank you. Back in Delaware Stadium where players are back on the field as we had a weather delay that took over 45 minutes. But as Carolyn Mano reported just moments ago, it looks like the worst of it is it to our east. And so now they will have a 15-minute warm-up period, which the Delaware Blue Hens are already taking advantage of. For more on the situation right now, let's check back in at the command center with Carolyn Mano. <laughs> yes, we are holding it down in the command center, Todd. I'm here with CAA official Michael Roach, who's today's crew leader. We know we just learned from Todd, that the players are actually taking the field. What are we looking at now in terms of time to where we can really get back to playing football? Yeah, once uh, the final lightning strike was just about 15 minutes ago, and the coaches have agreed that once we're cleared to play, which is after 30 minutes after the final lightning strike, uh, they'll take 15 minutes to warm up. So if they're now on the field, they'll take their 15 minutes to warm up, and we should be resuming play yeah. shortly thereafter. They have a state-of-the-art facility here going on just in terms of keeping everybody informed. How will you stay informed on the field of what's going on? Yeah, state-of-the-art is exactly the right phrase and term. Um, we'll, through their football liaison, they're very, very close in contact with us. So if any other fronts come through, if there's any other lightning or possible uh, storms coming through, they're going to let us know and give us a heads up for maybe time ahead, maybe 10, 15 minutes away, and they'll kind of monitor its course. And then if anything does come in the area, we'll go through the same protocol where we'll clear the stadium. And just for clarification, I'm hearing right now, so we have Delaware on the field, and they're going through a 15-minute warm-up. Is it a 15-minute warm-up for each team, correct? So we're looking at a half an hour, or is it 15 minutes total. Can you explain? Yeah, it's 15 minutes total time. So both teams will get their 15 minutes. Once Delaware State gets out there, they'll have their 15 minutes. So if there's an overlap of a minute or two, that's okay. But once both teams have their proper time, because you got to take into consideration as well, their kids have now been in the locker room for 30, 35 minutes, so they want to try to avoid injuries and that sort of stuff, so they'll warm up properly. Once both coaches are good to go, then we'll, we'll go uh, with the game. Okay, so as soon as Delaware State takes the field, the clock will start for 15 minutes for them to warm up. Yeah, that is correct. I'm sure they're probably communicating that with their locker room now, and then once they get out there, the 15-minute clock will start. What have you experienced in the past in terms of teams uh, being ready to play after a long hold? Like you said, they're in the locker room. Everybody's a little bit antsy. I mean, in your experience in dealing with the situation, what can we kind of expect for this this next half? Uh, yeah, I mean it can be it can be tricky. I mean obviously half times usually only 20 minutes long, so this is a kind of a double it. Uh, it's extended a little bit, but you know that's when coaching comes into play and that's when the players come into play. Um, I'm I'm expecting that it'll be the top level of football that we saw in the first half. And uh, would you have a rain jacket on? Because I know we're both about to get out there and get soaked. Now Todd and Ross are probably not as jealous that I'm in the command center because we're about to go out there and get rained on. Are you ready? We well, yeah, we're ready. We're all together in this. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for being with us. We appreciate it. Back to the studio. I'll go ahead and take that, Carolyn. So we have gone to Bermuda with Jim Cantori, Paul Burmeister living large out in San Diego, and, of course, Liam and the crew safe and dry in New York. And here's us out here fighting the elements. Well, and Notre Dame. We went out to That's South true. Bend as well. We're going all around the globe here. Tom Hammond, and we've been to the command center. All right, so here's the situation. As a former player, we have not seen Delaware State 
come out yet. Delaware's been out for now a good five minutes now. Is this plan? Delaware State said, hey, we might as well stay dry. No, I don't think so. I think maybe Delaware State just wasn't ready, or maybe they got the word later than Delaware did. I expect them to be out here soon. All righty. So that's the situation. We are about 15 minutes away from kicking off the second half of play here. Remember, this is the Route 1 rivalry. The first state cup is on the line with the Blue Hands on top, 28-7. Right now, let's send it back to Liam in the studios in New York. We are getting set to resume play here in the third corner. Before we get to that, let's set it down to the field. And Carolyn Mano. Todd, thank you very much. Joined by Delaware State head coach Kermit Blunt. And coach, you had an extended halftime to talk to your team. A couple of penalties uh, on that last drive. What did you tell your team at halftime? Well, you know, it, we were just a little bit out of character. And, uh, you know, you can't afford to give 30 yards of penalties up. I think we might have given up 40 yards of penalty on that one drive. And you can't win football games doing that. But, you know, that's mistakes that happen. We got to get past that, and we got to keep moving, and we just got to come out and play a little bit more consistent in the second half in order to get a win here. Still, you were able to take advantage of one of their mistakes and lack of focus. They got some points up on the board before half, and you guys have been hanging with them. And offensively, you came out very strong. Do you like what you guys are doing? You just need to clean it up. As long as we stay aggressive on offense and and, and defense, make plays. We didn't make plays on defense in a couple of drives. And it hurt us a little bit, so they hadn't earned anything yet. we got to make them earn what they get from here on out. And we, at the same time, got to be a little bit more consistent on offense. we got to keep the aggressive attack on offense with our short passing game and, and being able to, to attack them opposed to them attacking us. Coach, thank you very much. Good luck in the thank second you. half. Thank you. Thank you very much. The rain's still coming down very, very strong here, and it's actually getting a little bit more intense. Todd, let's get back to you. But there is no lightning, and that is the key, so fans can get back in the stands. Players on the field are thanks to Kermit Blunt in his second season at Delaware State after 16 years at Winston-Salem State University for his perspective. All right, well, the quarterbacks have really done a fine job today, and say what you will with the up-and-down momentum, but uh, Trent Hurley, let's start with him, the transfer from Bowling Green, number 12, running the show for Delaware. He's getting a lot of shots. But like you said, most of them are completions. Yeah, and let's not forget, this is only his second start as a college football player. But I'd say so far so good. He's been able to complete passes on the move using his mobility. He found the big tight end Boyle wide open over the middle. And he's been taking a lot of shots and still delivering strikes like that one to Michael Johnson. Take a look at some of the hits he's taken as well as his ability to run with the football. As we've said a couple of times, his mobility is the reason why he's the starting quarterback for the Delaware Blue Hens. Now he's showing them his toughness. They know about his mobility and agility. Now it's all about showing his teammates that he will stand in there and deliver a strike for a completion even though he takes a shot. 12 attempts, 7 completions for 102 yards and 1 touchdown. How about the numbers, though, for his backup? Tim Donnelly comes in 1 pass, 1 touchdown. He's good to go. Donnelly having to spell Hurley when he got hit and his helmet came off. By rule, he had to come off. As Carolyn pointed out, the rain continues to come down hard. And Jim Cantori telling us this would be the situation, but no lightning, so it is safe to play. Meanwhile, on the other side, Nick Elko, who came out and had a fantastic first two opening drives, then the pick 6 for 95 really changed the dynamics of this game. Well, they got him off to a good start with play action, rolling out, getting on the edge, and he was very accurate throughout the first half. I mean, getting the ball, dropping it in the bucket there, wherever he wants to go with the football, he was able to do it. Including a great catch by Bruton, and then he found Justin Wilson against man-to-man -man coverage on the quick slant for a touchdown. So the numbers for Nick Elko are solid, 17-24, 162 yards, a TD, and that interception, which was the pick six for 95. Well, and that changed the whole complexion yep. of the game. I mean, that one interception is by far the biggest play in this game so far because Delaware State was driving down yep. for a touchdown. And here's the, here's the deal now, Todd. When you come out in the second half at playing the elements, it's about ball security and it's about the quarterback center exchange. When it's raining this hard, that's what you need to be concerned about. That's what these coaches are telling their players about. As we take a look at the first half stats, Delaware State started out so well with two opening drives. It went into the red zone, yielding no points. 162 to 108, passing 29 to 59 in favor of the Blue Hands and total yards favoring Delaware State. But the two turnovers there at the bottom of your screen, really the tell-all. Yep, yeah, and it often is. I mean, you hear coaches talk about it all the time. But turnovers make a big difference, and this is no secret for Delaware. They forced four turnovers against Westchester last week, 
got fantastic field position as a result, and that's why they had a big victory a week ago. Both teams coming off opening week victories. Delaware getting Westchester 41-21. Delaware State getting VMI 17-10. This is awesome. I, mean, I know the delay wasn't cool, but this is what football is supposed to be about. Now, I wish they were on real grass, but as you see Casey Keeler, he's getting the hair wet. He looks good. Rain's coming down. I mean, when you grow up, you want to play football in the rain. It's fun. Mitchell Ward set to kick it off to the Blue Hens, who will get their first crack at it. Johnson and Hawkins back to receive. And we are underway in the second half here in Delaware Stadium with a nice return. Michael Johnson found a seam, got across midfield all the way to the 40 of Delaware State. I guess Michael Johnson had enough of a warm-up period. Didn't he, need the 15 he minutes. He hit the ground running right there. He takes it right up the middle. The best kickoff returns are just one cut. I don't even know if he made a cut. A little subtle cuts back and forth. He's an interesting story. Out of Gainesville, Florida, he had a number of SEC offers, and then the coaches were telling us yesterday, tore his ACL in the spring before his senior year, and all the SEC schools dropped off. That's how it happens sometimes. That's why he's a blue hen now. 52-yard return to open up the third quarter here after that lengthy weather delay, 28-7, hens on top, and I'm sure we'll get a heavy dose of this as number 30, Andrew Pierce, goes right up the middle, stopped by George Bansaw, number 93. Well, and for multiple reasons, right? not only because of the rain and the soggy football, but also because you want to continue to churn clock. I'm not trying to suggest that the Blue Hens are trying to run out the clock as we just start the third quarter, but the more they can shorten the game, the better for them with this 21-point lead. This game last year was only two hours and 37 minutes, and it was a complete whitewash by the Blue Hens, 45-0. Right now, the Hornets happy to be on the board, but remember, as the flag comes in late, they were turned away twice in the red zone, blocked field goal, and the pick six. And that will slow down play considerably. And we'll get the official word from Michael Roach. Personal foul, face mask, number 21 of the defense. 15-yard penalty, first down. Joe Boyd, the junior from Fort Washington, Maryland. It was a good fill by Boyd. He gets it right in the face mm. from Pierce, but then he uses the face mask to pull him down. You can use your hand like Pierce did right there. You can use your hand like that as long as you don't grab one. As long as it's a stiff arm and you are blunting the defender, which to me, I, let's just talk about this, Todd, quickly. With all the head trauma stuff, yeah. I, they got to eliminate Shot to the that. Face. You should not be able to punch a guy in the head like that. The stiff arm shiver you're saying should go away. First and 10 from the 22. Pierce off the right-hand side. Pierce just taken down at the 6. Or that would have been another touchdown for the Blue Hens. This is more like it for Andrew Pierce. This is what he's used to. The hen trying to go right on the football, but there's a down defender for Delaware State. Back at the 20-yard line. And it looks like big number 93, George Bansaw, the junior from Woodbridge, Virginia. Much to the chagrin of Ross Tucker, this is a artificial turf field, so mud and slop, not a problem. Traction shouldn't be an issue, but the rain has been coming down pretty steadily now for over an hour. And so as Carolyn Mano has to leave the safe confines of the command center and join us out here in the stadium play resumes now after the long weather delay 28 7 here the route one rivalry game in delaware stadium first and goal now from the seven pierce bouncing out to the right hand side cuts it back in he'll get down to the five I think this is an important drive as well for Delaware because they're trying to get back to the ground attack that they've enjoyed the last couple of years. You know, Pierce really only had a little over 80 yards last week. And today, as you can see right there, he's still averaging less than four yards a clip. They obviously want that to be closer to five. Second and goal from the five. Coach saying Andrew Pierce has no ego. He care less about his stat line as long as they get the win. 
Love to punch it in here. Pierce off the left-hand side, bounces to the right. He'll push the pile forward and take it down just inside the four. You know, one of these times, Trent Hurley is going to pull the football and run it himself because he is feeding Pierce, but at some point, he's going to elect to take it himself. You see him right here, hands it off to Pierce. But one of these, he's just going to pull it because he has the athleticism to get on the edge. Devon Moore doing a great job of coming up from his free safety position to make the stop, and that'll bring a third end goal now from the four. Snap kind of high, has to pitch it out. Pierce is, Pierce is there, and he's taken down from behind. A great job of pursuit. Number 91, I am Biola, senior from Greenbelt, Maryland, doing a great job on defense for the Hornets. Yeah, actually a pretty good job by Hurley just to get the football and still allow the play to run, but it slowed him down just enough that I am Biola was able to chase him down from behind. These Delaware State kids have played hard all game long. All six plays down here in the green zone, as they call it, were handoffs to Pierce. He can't punch it through, so that'll bring on the kicking unit, Sean Boehner. Boehner lines it up, and he punched it through for three more points. So the opening drive after the lengthy weather delay proves fruitful for the Blue Hens as they push their lead. Now 31-7 with 11.48 to play here in the third quarter. The Hornets will get their first crack at the ball here in the second half when we return to Delaware Stadium and the Route 1 rivalry. Every week, the NBC Sports Network takes you behind the scenes of the biggest matchups in Major League Baseball. This week, go inside Dodgers Giants on Caught Looking, Thursday, 9 Eastern, on the NBC Sports Network. This is the diehards only game after a lengthy weather delay at halftime. The true diehard followers of the Blue Hens and the Hornets have stayed here at Delaware Stadium, where it is 31 7, 11 48 to play in the third quarter. The rain continues to fall. But it's a warm rain, Ross, right? It's a warm rain in here. <laughs> <laughs> Alongside Ross Tucker, Carolyn Mano, I'm Todd Harris. Glad to have you with us on the second week of college football. It's the CAA UD taking on Delaware State out of the MEAC. And a nice return. And Tarpley all the way out to the 38-yard line. Tarpley gets taken down by the kicker, Sean Boehner. Otherwise, he is gone. Yeah, both kickoffs. Here in the second half, there have been wide open seams up the middle. I mean, much like Miles Johnson, he barely even had to make any cuts before the kicker chopped him down. 25-yard return. He had a nice 35-yard return in the first half as Travis Tarpley trying to get his squad into the end zone. They trail 31-7 in the early going here of the third quarter. Nick Elko comes out, empties the backfield out of the gun. This is where they had their success in the first two drives of the game. Inside, Deacon and Duncan, um, 81 is Ryan Langdon, and Langdon knocked out of bounds just shy of midfield by Paul Warlow, number 10. Well, and this is what they had the success with in the first quarter, and, and that is spreading the field and getting the ball out of his hand quickly. You know, a lot of times, Todd, I judge quarterbacks by how quickly they get the ball out of their hands because that shows the command of the offense. Plus, I'm a former offensive lineman, so I love when the quarterback gets the ball out of his hands quickly. Second down and one now from the 48. Elko on the give, up the middle, ball comes out. Momentarily free, but it'll stay. Hawkins and Williams teaming up to bring Malcolm Williams to the ground. Yeah, it's just a power play. You'll see the left guard pull up into the hole. Malcolm Williams bounces it out. Nice job by Jeff Williams, the freshman linebacker. Watch his right hand right here. His right arm rips the ball out before Williams is down. And Malcolm Williams, fortunate the ball bounced right back to him. First down, Hornets. First and 10 from midfield. Delaware State with their first option with the ball here in the second half. Williams again cuts it back to the outside, and that was a time maybe where he did not see the hole develop that he wanted. Big Ethan Clark and Tim Breaker there to meet him right at midfield. Yeah, and I'm a little surprised that the Hornets are running the football like this because, first of all, there is absolutely no wind as you take a look at yep. Williams on the straight drive, but there's no wind and typically receivers and quarterbacks like this weather because the receivers know where they're going. The defensive backs don't, so they have to react to the cuts 
and the routes of the receivers. Four receivers set to the top of the screen. They'll screen it out to the inside, trying to get to Williams. He does a great job of eluding the first two tacklers. He'll get it inside the 45-yard line, short of a first down. That'll bring up a big third. Patrick Callaway, Tim Breaker there to make the stop for the Blue Hats. Yeah, you see this all the time in college football, and it's really found its way into the NFL, and that is just the quick perimeter passing game. You know, you didn't see that as much in the NFL as you have recently. And is that by way of personnel, knowing that uh, Delaware State may be not as deep as the Blue Hens, so they're maybe getting the quickest guys they have to spread it out, trying to play power ball with the, the, uh, with the Hens? Of, yeah, the strength of the offense is the skill players. They want to get in their hands as quickly as possible. Don't count on the offensive line to hold the blocks for them. Third and four. Elko with pressure has his man wide open and if he could have got it to him in stride Tarpley could have taken another 15 20 yards good job by Tarpley though to bring it in also an excellent job by the Delaware State offensive line and pass protection unit Delaware comes with the pressure and they enable Elko to step up Tarpley was working against Justy out of the slot and got Justy all twisted around so first and 10 now from the 34. This is like the opening two drives that Delaware State have, which yielded no points. Now they'll go back to the running game up the middle with Dehong Chung. Momentarily saw a hole there, but he does pick up seven yards. It really does feel like the first quarter, doesn't yeah. it? I mean, because of the long delay, because of the way the Hornets played in the first quarter, they want to make a game of this. Vince Hollerman, the true freshman out of Woodbine, Georgia, there to make the stop for Delaware. Second down and four from the 28. Chong, nice job bouncing it back inside, and he's close to first down yardage. They're going to stop him right at the 25 yard line. This is going to be short by about half a yard. Delaware State has a pretty nice stable of young running backs. I mean, Malcolm Williams is fairly young. Chong, we've seen Najee Jackson as well. And Lamar Shaw, number 45, the redshirt freshman out of Mount Vernon, New York, also in that stable. So third and one from the 25. Chong stays in the game, breaks it up the middle, does a great job, not only of getting the first down yardage, but holding on to the ball because big Paul Warlow was there to ride him to the turf. And he broke a tackle in the backfield, which was really the key. He might not have had the first down if it wasn't for that broken tackle. Wholesale substitutions coming for the Blue Hands. Remember, they were operated on a three-man front. Why? Well, defensive coordinator Nick Rapone saying, I've got to get my best athletes on the field. His counterpart across the way, Arrington Jones, trying to find a way now to punch it in. Now, they had success in the first half with number seven, Justin Wilson, going one-on-one. -on -one. First and ten from the 20. Pick to the inside, and again, they find their big tight end, Ryan Langdon, 6'4", 250 from nearby Philadelphia. That's the second time they've run this play. Watch the right side of your screen. As soon as Langdon comes in, watch the block by Justin Wilson. He actually gets two guys. It's interesting because it almost looks like it's a pick play, but Elko throws it so quickly that Wilson can just start to block as soon as Langdon catches the football. I like the design of that. Jake Justy able to cut him down. Now it's inside the 10-yard line, so first and goal from the nine. Back to the running game of Williams. Bounce it left, bounce it right, falls forward, does a great job of picking up positive yards. He's taken down at the seven-yard line. It'll be second and goal. A lot of penetration there. Williams did a pretty good job just to find a couple yards, bounce it around. So here's the question. We saw this same kind of drive from the Hornets in the first two possessions where they picked up eight first downs in two possessions. That's more than double than they got all of last year's game. And then they really stalled out in the second quarter. What's been the difference? Yeah, well, and they, and they got to convert now here. Inside the red zone, second and goal from the seven. Pass down below, has his man, juggle it momentarily, but brings it in, and he's going to be marked down at the one. Paul Warlow there to make the stop to keep him out, and it's Travis Tarpley, just 5'7", 170, but the senior from Danville, Virginia, really can do it all for the squad. Yeah, and to answer your question, Todd, the difference is there is no difference. I mean, as long as they've been doing this, they've had success. As long as they've been spreading the field and getting the ball out of Elko's hands quickly, they've had success. But now they got to punch it in. So they go back to the power formation. Elko under center. Third and goal from the one. 
up the middle, 34, can't break the line, and Najee Jackson, 6'1", 215 freshman out of Gainesville, Virginia, can't get across the line. Well, he's their big back, and he elected to leave his feet, and when you leave your feet like that, you lose all your power, and he got popped right in the middle of the air. Who was there to meet him? Number 10, Paul Warlow. So decision time for the Hornets and head coach Kermit Blunt and his offensive coordinator Arrington Jones say, fellas, let's go for this. Back in the I formation from the one, Elko will be under center. Second man through and he's in. Touchdown Hornets. Najee Jackson able to punch it in. So a great job by Kermit Blunt, head coach deciding to go for it on fourth. Yeah, here's the third down play when Paul Warlow, number 10, just stuffs Najee Jackson. Then here's fourth down where he runs over Leon Jackson into the end zone. I think the play in the huddle was same play, just run away from number 10. And that's exactly what they did. So now 13 points more than they had last year. Delaware State, 31-13, they trail. But a game that they really have done a great job with, and they are going to go for two points now. Try to cut it to 16. They'll spread the field. They'll put Malcolm Williams in the backfield, but this is a five receiver set. Flag comes out, and we look like we may have a substitution penalty. Substitution infraction on the offense. It's a five yard penalty. Replay the try. So they back it up now. Uh, Ross, what do you think? Still go for it? Uh, well, no, I wouldn't. I was surprised that they were doing that in the first place. Try, trying to get it down to 16 points, two scores, and uh, Kermit Blunt said, fellas, we practice this. This quick change, quick momentum, catch them sleeping, and then we just get a penalty, and yeah. not so much. And that's probably what the chart says, you know, to, to go for two, so you get to 16 within two scores, but I often say I don't think you should even look at the chart until the fourth quarter. You know, an extra point is a free point, right? Yeah. Take it rather than, you know, the 50% chance of getting the two-point conversion. Teams the likes of Penn State and Utah learned that lesson the hard way of giving away free points. And a flag comes out now, and this looks like it might be a substitution. Delay a game on the offense. It's a five-yard penalty. Replay the try. And I'm done speculating on what the call may be because it looked like Delaware made a substitution at the last second. Travis Tarpley pleading his case. Tell you what, in about 45 seconds, this is going to be a 45-yard field goal attempt. <laughs> Might as well go for two. <laughs> Hail Mary for the two points. Let's go, and these are the things that you just wonder how much they've really practiced, right? You Travis, know, during two a days, how many times have they done field goals in the rain? Travis Tarpley very upset with the officials saying that the ball unable to be set and they didn't get enough time to set up. They were over the ball. Burn the clock. Tarpley on the hole. Kick is up in good, plenty of distance, so they do get their one point. It's now 31-14 with 5.04 to play. The Hornets trying to mount a comeback. Yep, and they did it on the ground. Najee Jackson finishing the run strong. The Delaware State Hornets are still in this thing. College football on the NBC Sports Network is presented by GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit GEICO.com for a free rate quote. Rocking a little different fashion here at Delaware Stadium as the rain continues to come down after a lengthy weather delay. We are back to the Route 1 rivalry. 31-14, the Blue Hens on top as they get set to receive the Mitchell Ward kickoff after the Delaware State squad goes seven plays, 37 yards, three minutes. And that one goes out of bounds, yielding yet another flag. Well, that, that really stinks if you're Delaware State because that hurts your momentum tremendously because you're going to give the ball to Delaware with outstanding field position now. Five oh four to play here in the third quarter. It has been a long game when you tack on the extra forty minutes of weather delay. And for more on the weather, let's check Free in with Carolyn. Free kick Carolina. out of bounds on the kicking team. Delaware will take over on the thirty-five. First down. Michael Roach giving us the signal. Now we check in with Carolyn. 
Hey guys, just talk to Jerry O'Ravitz. You'll remember he was the director of football operations. He said he was just in the command center. We've been cleared for the night. So aside from this rain, we shouldn't have any other weather issues, Todd. All right, thank you, Carolyn. That'll be disappointing for Ross. He was really hoping to get a shot in that command center. I'm still going there after the game. Just to say you went there. 31-14, 5.04 to play. So it's just heavy rain from here on out. The lightning has passed us by, which is the good news. And on the fly sweep, it's number 17 for Delaware, not getting around the corner. Michael Johnson. Not the track star, but the Delaware Blue Hen, and Ernest Ajay brings him down for a negligible game. There are some similarities, though. You know, they're both about 6'2", and Michael Johnson can run very well in his own right, but that time, Delaware State was all over. You know, we used to see that play all the time. Yeah. You don't see it that often anymore. You know, people just do such a good job of anticipating it when they see that receiver in motion it just and seems get like out it, in front of it. it. Unless you have an absolute burner, the play takes so long to develop that the free and the strong safety can come over and kind of cover it. On second down, Trent Hurley now rolling out to his right. He takes another shot, finds his receiver off the chest of Stephen Clark, who was open. And again, Hurley hit for about the 27th time here in this game. It's a good thing that they have a backup quarterback with some experience with the hits that he's taken. And you don't expect your quarterback to take hits on plays like that, Todd. You know, bootlegs, naked. Rolling he's, away. Yeah, he's supposed to be clean on that. That's why you do that. You're trying to change up the pocket a little bit. That's not clean. No, you see the, the black rubber pellets because it's not mud. Third down and nine from the 36. Four receivers set for the Blue Hens. Pierce, the lone setback. He'll come in to help out and block. And again, the white jersey swarming Trent Hurley yet again, led by Big 91, Olu. Yeah, I am Biola again getting in there on Trent Hurley. They brought pressure. You can see it. It's a six-man pressure. And he's matched up against Andrew Pierce. And that's tough duty to ask a running back to block a big outside linebacker like I am. Anytime you see that in the NFL, it rarely goes well for the offense as well. That was more than a 100-yard weight differential on that matchup. Punt is away. Takes a bounce at the 35, and it'll be down inside the 24. Make it the 23, and that's where the Hornets will take over. So with 3.38 to play in the third quarter, it's the Blue Hens on top of the Hornets, 31-14. You're watching the Route 1 rivalry for the first state cup. Where does a great night out get even better? At the new Ruby Tuesday with our steak and lobster dinner for only $14.99. We've combined sweet lobster, steakhouse sirloin, and our... 3.38 to play here in the third quarter from Delaware Stadium on the campus of UD. Delaware State getting the ball back. They trail 31-14. Now, if they could get a drive going like they had the last time, chew up about four or five minutes a clock, get seven more points, they could be in business. They hand it off to 25. Malcolm Williams, the junior out of Reading, Pennsylvania, he's taken down by Paul Warlow, number 10. Yeah, and I'm surprised they're running the football here. I mean, you're still down by 17 points. You've had almost all your success in the air. I think they need to get a little bit of a move on when you're down three scores like this, especially when they've had the most success that way. Got four receivers down here to the near side. Second down and six from the 27. Elko looks left, looks back right, comes back to his back, and his back probably would have been wise to just drop that ball as he loses yardage on the play. Well, and you could see what Nick Elko wanted to do there. He looked to the single receiver side to Justin Wilson. He didn't like what he saw. And by the time he came back to the four receiver side, the Delaware Blue Hens were all over it. And again, because of those two plays, number one, a run, and number two, uh, sort of a unique formation there, now they're in a third and 10. Third down and 10, ball resting at the 23 of Delaware State. The Hornets, once again, four receivers set with one lone setback. Elko out of the gun. Looking left, looking left, has to come right, has his man, and does a great job finding number eight, Josh Bailey, Tim Breaker there to make the stop. But give credit to Elko, wanted to go left, had to come back right, and kept his eyes downfield the entire time. He did, and he showed good feet in the pocket as well. I've been really impressed with Nick Elko today. Watch him work the pocket. I mean, this has got to be his second or third read, and again, much like Hurley, takes a shot 
as he delivers the football. Also had Justin Bruton out there, but elected to go to Bailey on the inside. Bailey, the senior from Richmond, Virginia, 5'11", 200 pounds, as he limps off the field and is close enough that the officiating crew wants to measure this one. At first glance, I thought he got it. Boy, and you still got those Princeton eyes. First down for Delaware State. They keep the drive alive as we check in with Carolyn. Hey, guys, well, just over on the Delaware State sideline, I can tell you they are re-energized here out of halftime, especially the defense now on the sideline. They were going crazy just now a minute ago, pumping each other up, saying, let's go, let's go. So they are ready to make a run here if they can. Todd. Thank you, Carolyn. Good shot at Kermit Blunt in his second season as the head coach here after 16 years at Winston-Salem State University. Actually played quarterback there against Casey Keeler, who played his ball at Delaware. Out of the backfield this time, they find Williams cuts it to the inside. A lot of blue jerseys around there. And by the time that bubble screen gets back to the line of scrimmage, Ricky Tunstall is there, number four, to make the stop. Yeah, and it's time to time to get rid of that play. I mean, that, let's be honest, the play's not. Are you working. saying that from an offensive lineman, or just it's just ineffective in this no, game? No, it's ineffective because by the time he throws the ball to Malcolm Williams, all of the linebackers and DBs for Delaware are rallying to the football because it's almost like you can see it coming. Right. It, he telegraphs it, and Malcolm Williams is catching that football six or seven yards behind the line of scrimmage. It's not a very effective play. Second and ten now from the 33. Elko looking left, wanting to go long, has his man, and was there early contact? No. Marcus Burley, the 2011 All-CAA second teamer there to break it up. Nice play there by Burley. Remember, Burley was victimized a couple times in the first half. Does a nice job staying with Justin Wilson. I'm really not sure what kind of route Justin Wilson was running right there. It did look like number two had a handful of white cloth. But they'll let that one slide, bringing up a third down and 10 now from the 33. And this, with a minute 22 to go in the third quarter, this is a big drive for the Hornets if they can keep this thing alive into the fourth quarter. Let's see if they can convert yet another third and long. Five receivers set for Elko. Looking downfield, has his man picked off. Tim Breaker at midfield, and we've already had one pick six. Can he bring it back? He's got a line of blockers. And he's going to be tackled at the 27, but a bad play and a flag late comes in. Yeah, it's going to be against Lath Walschlager. And Walschlager already hit with a penalty early on. Remember, he roughed the punter that kept the first score alive for the Hornets. As the officials talk it over, head coach Keeler not happy. After the interception, personal foul, number 46. The return team. It's a 15-yard penalty. First down. So the Blue Hands hold on to the ball, but they are backed up considerably one more time. Well, watch Elko. I think Tarpley stopped his route. Elko thought Tarpley would keep going, but Tarpley stopped his route. And then you see Timmy Breaker trying to equal what his former high school teammate did. At the very end there, you see Walschlager come through. You know, we didn't mention yet that Breaker went to high school with Ricky Tunstall. Glassboro High School in South Jersey, right near Rowan University, which is where Casey Keeler used to coach before he came here to Delaware. 31-14 Delaware, Blue Hands with the football. After that interception, Nick Elko on the sideline talking with his offensive coordinator, Arrington Jones, and that was a tough one as Travis Tarpley was the intended receiver, and it goes the way of the Blue Hands. Back come Delaware, Trent Hurley finding the quick strike out to the right-hand side. That's 17, Michael Johnson, and Johnson rolls forward for 11 yards, picking up a first down. Really liked the design of that play. Everything told the defense that the football was coming to their right side, so... You can see all the white defenders run here to our near side. And then Hurley came back and threw it to Johnson on the other side. Trent Hurley, the transfer from Bowling Green University, said Delaware's a school that recruited him out of high school, but he wanted to play Division I, went to Bowling Green and said, you know, it's just not the right fit, came back to Delaware, and they were happy he did. And that was a beautiful ball. Nick Boyle, whether it was the wet hands or what, or was it too much heat on that? Well, it's the second time he had a little bit too much heat on a, a short pass over the middle especially when it's a wet football right Boom. through there. Now, I will say this, though. Boyle will tell you he should catch that. 
And it's interesting, getting back to Trent Hurley and him transferring, both he and head coach Casey Keeler said the exact same thing to us yesterday. He went to Bowling Green for the wrong reasons. He went because he wanted to play FBS football, and that's not why you should go to a, a school like that. You should go because it's the right fit for you. Second down and 10 from the 44. Hurley with time, throws the ball, a little wobbler out there as he's looking to the outside for Jarrell Harrison. Transferring to Delaware seems to be a trend that, uh, for, the, for the most part, has worked out pretty good. Throw a few names out there. Hurley, of course, coming the way of Bowling Green. But how about the names on there? Uh, Andy Hall was in camp with Philadelphia. Joe Flacco done all right with Baltimore. And Pat Devlin, if you ever watch uh, NFL Hard Knocks, he's, he's kind of the star of that show. Well, and the reality is there's really only about 75, 80 quarterbacks in the NFL with two you know, teams keeping either two or three. The Delaware has two of them. Third down and 10 from the 44 now. Hurley with time, steps up the pocket, and that one, love to get that back. He was looking for David Hayes, who was coming out of the backfield, nowhere near him, so the Blue Hens will have to put it away with 25 and a half seconds. They have the lead 31-14, but here you see the third quarter, and it seems like both teams a little bit out of sync as we come up on the fourth quarter with 25 seconds to play here in the third. Yeah, I am surprised that they didn't run the football at all on that series, and it looked like he was not on the same page with Hayes. One of the most unique punters in college football, Zaragoza, can rugby-style punt at left, can rugby-style punt at right, or he can do conventionally. This one will be a touchback. And that'll take us down to 16 seconds to play. Turnovers really have been a key, and the head man for both schools told us we can't afford to turn the ball over. Well, the first one was what happens when you throw it late and high over the middle, and Ricky Tunstall took that one all the way to the house. And this one was just a miscommunication. Elko thought that Tarpley would keep going, and he didn't. And you can see them talking about it right there. Not the most athletic interception by Tim Breaker, and I'm sure Ricky Tunstall will say, mine was 95-yard returner. I had to dance and bobble it. That one came right to you, and he was. <laughs> he was just sitting in center field, and when Tarpley broke it off, there was no one there to make the reception. So it's back to the Hornets with 16 seconds to play, first and 10 now from the 20. Williams off the right-hand side, and he runs into a whole mess of blue and gold, led by number 57, Jeff Williams, who injured his ankle early in this game. Good to see him back out there, well taped up on the right ankle. But that will take us to the end of the third quarter here at the Route 1 rivalry from Newark, Delaware. On the line, it's the first State Cup, and right now it looks like the Blue Hands are going to keep it here for the fourth year. The score, 31-14, as we head to the fourth. Back at Delaware Stadium as we take a look at the Buffalo Wild Wings game reset. And all you really need to do is look at that bottom left corner and that uh, number two there. Yeah, that's obviously been the difference in the game. And I got to tell you something else. Looking at Hurley's numbers, that doesn't really feel indicative of how he's played. Less than 50% of his pass is completed. I feel like he's played better than that. He's had some big throws, and he's done it under constant duress. So here we go with the fourth and final quarter with the Route 1 rivalry on the line. This is the first State Cup game. These teams have met three times before. All victories going the way of the Blue Hens as Ryan Langdon takes the reception cut down quickly by Jake Justine. And I'd like to see a little more tempo in the Delaware State huddle. You know, when you're down three scores in the fourth quarter, you don't really have a lot of time to milk the clock, the play clock, and, and, and take your good old time. you got to get up to the line of scrimmage quickly. Kermit Blunt, the head man in his second season for the Hornets, a four-year starter quarterback at Winston-Salem State University. Third and six. Quick pass to the inside. That was the same strike they got for a touchdown earlier. And once again, they get Justin Wilson on single coverage for a nice pickup and a first down. Quincy Barr, number 90, has to come back and make the stop. Yeah, I was just about to say, that looks familiar, doesn't it? I mean, free man off the edge. I like how Elko just stepped into that. You know, that, that can't be easy. I never played quarterback, but you see a guy coming clean off the edge, and you just step right into him and deliver a strike. I like that. 
First and 10 now, Elko going back to work, and again, that was a beautiful pass, threading the needle, and Paul Warlow there to separate Ryan Langdon from the ball. Boy, I like everything about Paul Warlow. Had a chance to talk to him on the field before the game. He actually lost 10 pounds and is down to 225 pounds as he delivers the shot right there. Wanted to have a lot of quickness, and I told him on the field before the game, listen, you're going to make your hay in the NFL next year in camp on special teams, so stay light and stay lean so you can really run and be athletic. Second and 10 now from the 38. Pressure coming from the hens. And he gets it away. A nice job by Elko. Pass is caught. Travis Hawkins on the coverage. And Bruton does a great job. It looks like he's going to be just short of the first. Not a very effective blitz right there by Delaware. And Elko just getting it past the outstretched hands of Hawkins. Hawkins had good coverage, but that's why as a quarterback, you always throw the ball away from wherever the defender is. Wherever the defender's leverage is, throw it away from him. We're seeing a very impressive game by Elko, and we're seeing how why he had Maryland high school records, Todd, for touchdowns and yards back in 2007 in the whole state of Maryland. First and 10 now from the 48. Back to the running game. It's Williams who bounces it out to the right side. Does a great job there. Paul Warlow once again to make the stop. Justin Bruton has had a nice game tonight. Not only that catch he made there coming back and covering up, but also the catch we saw in the first half. The one-hander that kept the drive alive on the sideline. That is going to be on a lot of highlight shows in the Northeast tonight. Yeah, that's got to be a, a top 10 play. Maybe that'll be on the lights Monday morning. Clock continues to run under 13 minutes to play in the ball game. Second down and five from the 47. Williams with a lot of traffic there, and he goes right into the teeth. And once again, Paul Warlow and Ethan Clark there to corral him. I don't know, Todd. I, I got to tell you, I, I'm not exactly sure the strategy here. I mean, you're having success when you throw the football, and then to have two inside runs on back-to-back -back plays as the clock continues to tick is a power play, and Jadira Green took way too wide of a pull on that play, and Warlow filled it in again. Once again, they go into a pro set formation, I formation. Elko under center, dropping back, looking downfield, having time, and now flush from the pocket, looking right. And he'll just throw this one away. Yeah, he had nowhere to go with the football. When he rolled out to the right there, there was nobody there. But he had a decent amount of time while he was in the pocket. So on a third and seven, Delaware State forced to punt it away. Take a look at Travis Tarpley. With the deep post, he felt like he was open. But by that time, Elko had already rolled out to the right. I don't know if he thinks he could have gotten the ball down the field that deep while he was on the move. Marco Cano back to punt it away. Remember, his only foray into punting was the one that went between the wickets, and he got roughed up. And that kept the drive alive, leading to Delaware State's first score. This one will be kicked out of bounds at about the 8-yard line. No return opportunity for Ricky Tunstall. So we're down to the final 11 minutes and 54 seconds to play here at Delaware Stadium. The Blue Hens will have the ball, leading 31-14 when we return to the campus of the University of Delaware. So Trent Hurley leads the Blue Hens back out on the field. They'll take over here in the fourth quarter, 11.54 to play as the rain continues to fall after a lengthy weather delay at halftime. Play came out, and the Blue Hens came right out of the locker room, going down the field, punching it in for three points, and they have been stout here in the second half, only giving up one touchdown to Delaware State. First and ten, they'll run it off the right-hand side with Andrew Pierce. Pierce breaks into the secondary, finally taken down by number 53, Ernest Ajay, but a nice pickup for Andrew Pierce. Yeah, really well blocked by both guards on the play. Nick Catalico and J.D. Zerko both got on the edge. Pierce was able to split them. And you have to imagine that's exactly what Casey Keeler and the Delaware offensive coaches are looking for. Injured player on the field for Delaware State and the Hornets. 96 is Chikese Ukeji, senior from Staten Island, New York. You got to think, Todd, 
that Delaware really wants to try to establish the run. I mean, it's an inexperienced offensive line. Brandon Heath, the right tackle, is really the only guy with starting experience. And you take a look at this first down run. Watch both guards pull out in front. And you can see the injury as well as Brandon Heath went low on a Casey. And then you see both guards pull out in front. 6'4", 285-pound young man. He's a senior out of Staten Island. And that is a scary injury when you see someone go low and the body doesn't go with and the knee stays stays in place. You know, I, I cut a lot. That's a cut block right, right there by Brandon Heath. When I played, I cut a lot. It's a very effective way to block. But the older I get and the more games I watch, I almost think they should consider eliminating it because it does seem like there are so yep. many injuries. First and 10 now from the 23 here in the fourth quarter. Trent Hurley with a lone setback being Andrew Pierce. Stands tall in the pocket, very patient, gets his tight end. and. Almost parting the waters there is big number 86, Nick Boyle. Had to regroup and grab his footing before Rodney Gunter brought him down to the turf. He'll be short of first down, but a nice pickup of eight. Yeah, Boyle is really a good-looking prospect. He's only a sophomore, true sophomore. Still a little raw with his blocking technique, but the coaches raved about him to us yesterday. He played as a true freshman last year because the starting tight end, Colin Narble, got hurt. So they had to throw him into the fire. Sophomore to Lake Hamilton, Florida. Once again, back to the running game. And Andrew Pierce up the middle. He's going to be short of the first down by about half a yard. And that's going to bring up the third down. But this is an opportunity for head coach Casey Keeler in his 11th season at Delaware to really try to establish a run, work with that offensive line, because that is the area they are most concerned about on offense. Now, defense is, of course, the linebackers, but this offensive line, if they can get them to gel quickly, earn, qu learn quickly, and protect Trent Hurley, they might have something going here. Pierce up the middle once again on third down, and this is going to be depend on forward progress, but it looks like he's got the first down. Ernest the Jai there to make the stop first off for the Hornets. Yeah, I think he got it, but I think that there was really more there in terms of Andrew Pierce and the run. I think if he would have popped it out to the near side here, his right side, he would have had a little bit more room. And that is going to be a first down, so they'll move the chains. We talked about Casey Keeler in his 11th season at Delaware. 82-46 and 46 overall, the 2003 national champions in the FCS. But they've been to that game three times. In 07 and 09, they were the runner-up. He is an 81 grad of this school. And there's some pictures of him. He had a little mean face on him when he was playing linebacker. Yeah, and he started on the national championship team in 79, actually with my uncle, my uncle Mike Bachman. Started a defensive tackle while Casey Keeler was the linebacker. Coach Keeler did not like the lineup he saw out there, so he burns a timeout here, their first here in the second half as he gets his team together, and he like to see this game end quickly with the score remaining the same and everyone healthy. We'll be back to Delaware Stadium, 31-14, hens on top. Hey, Carol Amato down the sidelines with an update on Chakizi UKG. He will be back in the game. He's fine. He took a helmet to the knee. Delaware State's uh, defensive lineman, but he is okay. Todd, back to you. All right, thank you very much, Carol. 9.50 to play here in the ball game. David Hayes is now checked in at the tailback position after Andrew Pierce has been getting really the yeoman's workload, and that is going to start it as we have a false start after a timeout. Come on. Really, Ross? False snap. False start. Number 79 in the offense. It's a five-yard penalty. First down. I'm just saying what coach was thinking. Yeah, I'm glad I played college football before they called the guys' names out. <laughs> the, you know, the jersey numbers. You know, when I played college football, they wouldn't say the jersey number just for, the, for the guilty party. You don't have to worry about that till the NFL. Now, even in college football, they call your number out. What's next? High school? Pop Warner? That'll back them up another five. So first and 15 from the 28. And the game has slowed down pace-wise incredibly as Delaware State unable to establish that run pass that they were trying to go for, which simply mesmerized a lot of us why they would be passing the ball, trailing by three scores. Delaware State will go up the middle, and they'll pick up yardage up to about the 35-yard line. Nick Catalico has had a bit of a rough day. Well, it started early in the game where he got a block up on number 58, Fortis, but you see that right hand right there. And they ended up calling the hold. 
And that pulled back a touchdown. Here it is again, 79 this time missing the block, and his quarterback pays the price. Fortunately, it did end up in a touchdown. Well, and, and Nick's a guy I think really could be best served by losing some weight. I think if he lost 20 pounds, he'd be a more athletic, agile player. Great job of defense by the Hornets as they contain Hurley. They sent everyone at him, and the secondary does a great job of keeping the receivers in front of them, and they knock him out of bounds at about the 37-yard line, well short of a first down. It's all about Nick Boyle right now. I mean, that three passes in a row where Hurley's been looking at the young sophomore tight end. Nick Boyle, the sophomore from Wardage, New Jersey, 6'4", 235 pounds. Coaches say he has huge potential. Just needs some game time. So third and six now from the 37. Pierce the lone setback for the Hens. Fly sweep didn't work exactly how they planned it up as the man who went in motion bumped into the quarterback. And then Nick Hurley takes not one but two shots from the Hornets before he's thrown down Will Shirt of first down just inside the 40. Yeah, that play was doomed from the start. And it started with Jarrell Harrison. Hitting Hurley when your motion man takes a shot at you, you know it's not your day. Yep, and then and then Hurley took another shot. That's the type of thing that Casey Killer does not want to see happen. His starting quarterback taking shots like that. It's okay if he takes them from the guys in the white jersey, but when he's taking them from his own team, that's where you need to have a chat. So they'll punt it away on fourth down and three. Raleigh Zaragoza, a little modified rugby left, punches it up the middle. Nice punt, good coverage by the hands and. The Hornets will let this one roll down inside the 15-yard line. That's where it comes to a stop. The Hornets will take over with 7.37 to play in the ball game. They trail 31-14, and Trent Hurley on the phone saying, guys, give me a little help here. But the Blue Hens have this one in hand. We'll see if the Hornets can mount something when we return. Back in Newark, Delaware, let's take a look at who had the edge brought to you by Comcast Business Edge. Well, Delaware has the edge in part because of this pick by Nick Boyle. Now, they'll tell you that was just a rub route and it opened up the touchdown to Jarrell Harrison earlier in the game. When you're a tight end like Boyle, you're allowed to run your route. If they think that you're seeking out a defender and actively trying to impede him, they will call that. But if they feel like you're just staying on your route and there happens to be contact, then it's not a penalty. So 7.36 to play now in the ball game. 31-14, Delaware on top of the Hornets of Delaware State. And that pass was sniffed out early. Travis Tarpley meets up with Ricky Tunstall, who already has a pick six for 95 yards. And that play's going nowhere. Tunstall's an impressive player. Yeah. yeah he, he really is a nice player. I know he's hoping to get a shot at the next level as well. And I, I would not be surprised if he does. Tunstall, number four, the senior out of Bridgeton, New Jersey. They say he's the best athlete on the team, no question about it. Yeah, and just to give you a little understanding of the talent level here, Delaware had nine players in NFL training camps this summer, and six are on active rosters right now. And once again, Elko doing a good job of looking left, coming back right, had the single coverage on Justin Wilson and Travis Hawkins. Does not yield a lot of yardage, but this is what they did to start the game off when they had those two impressive open drives. They mixed it up, a nice balance of inside passing, outside passing, and they'd come with a run, really kept Delaware guessing where they were going next. Right, and if I'm head coach Kermit Blunt, I'm thinking this is four down territory. So I don't have to call a play here on third down that necessarily gets a first down, down three scores with six and a half minutes remaining. Third down and seven from the 17. And way too much heat on that one. He had the receiver he wanted, Justin Wilson, but Travis Hawkins, who they picked on a bit today, stands up tall on that one and knocks it free. Well, and the reason why Hawkins was able to make that play is he saw it coming. Because Nick Elko, as soon as he got the ball, set his feet, and you can see him coming back to the single receiver side. They've done that so many times today that I think Hawkins said, not this time. So the Hornets will punt it away with Marco Cano. Cano's third punt of the night. Tunstall will have an opportunity to return this one from the 45. He's cut down at the 47-yard line of Delaware State. So the Hornets need to stand tall and make something happen quick. 6.05 left in this one when we return to Delaware Stadium. 
Head coach Casey Keeler looking at the upcoming schedule. They've got Bucknell next week, and then they go to William & Mary and New Hampshire before returning to Delaware Stadium to take on Maine and Rhode Island in the CAA. First and 10 from the 47 after the punt returned by Tunstall. They'll give it up to Pierce on the left-hand side, and he will burn off another 10-yard run, a nice run for Andrew Pierce, the senior from Bridgeton, New Jersey. Yeah, and you love this time of the ball game if you're an offensive lineman. When you have a nice lead, when you're just trying to grind the clock, it's almost like going back to high school or junior high football where it's a run every play. You get to just tee off. They made a change on the offensive line. The left guard, J.D. Zerko, is, new, is now at center. Pierce off the right-hand side. Offensive line doing a great job. And if it's not for the ankle grab of Devon Moore, he is into the end zone. CAA football continues next Saturday. We will be at Towson as Towson takes on William and Mary. And we talk about the CAA. Normally people say, oh, it's Delaware, it's Delaware. Maybe not so much this year because you've got a couple teams that will be leaving the CAA next season. And uh, I think a lot of people would like to leave on a high note. Delaware probably not up to the level they're usually accustomed to here in Newark. Yep, and Towson won the league last year. As we've said a number of times, the FCS doesn't get any better than the CAA. I mean, the CAA is as good as it gets, so every game we'll be able to call here and watch on the NBC Sports Network will really be encouraging. It's funny, Todd, because these are the only two conferences that I really looked at coming out of high school, the Ivy League, and, of course, we've got a six-game package of Ivy League games here on the NBC Sports Network and the CAA, uh, almost went to William and Mary in Delaware, but elected to go to the Ivy League instead. First and 10 from the 23 as Andrew Pierce stays in the game, and that's going to call a flag, a false start for those offensive linemen that you were just touting. False start, number 79 of the offense. It's a five yard penalty. First down. I don't want to pick on Nick Catalico because my partner's already done that, but uh, the penalty goes his way. Listen, I'm not picking on Nick. He's, he's had a couple penalties, which I'm sure he's not happy about. And I just think watching him on film yesterday, we had a chance to watch yep. him on tape and watching him pull a little bit. I just think he'd be better served as a player if he was about 25 pounds less. If you look at NFL offensive lines, there really aren't very many guys that are 345 pounds. Hayes to the inside. He gets it inside the 25-yard line, and the clock will continue to go. That was a first and 15. Tarek Colston, number 29, there to make the stop. Well, we talk a lot about Casey Keeler, and he was kind enough to let us sit in his office yesterday and told some great stories about Joe Flacco and meeting Vice President Biden and some of the other great tales. But his name, and I think you brought up a very telling story, after winning the national championship at 03 and then getting there again in 07 and 09, you've got to think the next time an FBS school is looking for a coach they've got to look in newark delaware yep and his name has been out there for michigan and connecticut over the over the last four or five years when those jobs opened up but i mean he said to us yesterday this is home this is where he went to school uh he and his wife are entrenched in the community they really enjoy it here told us a great story about when they were playing in the playoffs for that national title run and phone rang and it said vice president joe biden on caller id now why vice president biden doesn't have caller ID blocked I don't know but uh, <laughs> offered the opportunity offered the opportunity of his family to ride down an Air Force Two with the vice president to the FCF's playoffs I nice. never even knew there was an Air Force Two I think they go to like Air Force 22 there's really a, there's a button no, I don't know oh. there's a I just know one and two third and five from the 18 going to the end zone has his man and catch is made touchdown blue hands Jarrell Harrison hauls it in. We had to wait and see if the officials were going to give it to him because he bobbled it coming down, but nice throw by Hurley. Really nice touch on the fly pattern by Harrison. I think they caught Delaware State sleeping a little bit because they had been running the ball all the way down the field. Again, Hurley takes a shot and just gets it over the outstretched hands of Nick Williams. Harrison pulls it in. Sean Boehner on for the extra point. He punches it through. It's now a 38-14. Remember last year's score, 45-0. So an improvement for Delaware State. But in talking with the coaches there, they said, we're still a little bit away from Delaware and where they are. But a beautiful pass and way to bring it in. 
Jarrell Harrison, the freshman from Richmond, Virginia. Right, and, and oh. in talking, I know, Hurley again taking that shot. That's one of the things that will be a point of emphasis yep. for Casey Keeler, Greg Perry, and this offensive coaching staff tomorrow, Jim Hoffer as well. They, they just can't afford to have their no. quarterback taking this many shots. They're not even in the conference season yet. And you think about the heat that teams like uh, Old Dominion, Towson, Villanova are going to bring their way. He's not going to be standing in November if he continues to take shots like that throughout the season. No, you know what's crazy about any level of football, but college football in particular? Delaware State has still outgained the University yeah. of Delaware. And they have more than 10 minutes more of time of possession. Right around 10 minutes more time of possession, yet they're down by 24 points. 38-14 with three minutes to go. Six plays, 47 yards, and they cover it in 305. And right now, head coach Kermit Blunt is thinking, you know what, we were in this thing early. Let it get away. A couple turnovers, really the difference, as Delaware State yielding up 10 points as they give up the pick six and the blocked field goal. Went into the locker room, had the 40-minute weather delay and here we go tarpley once again the bright spot for delaware state his kickoff returns this is a night nice one out to the 30. yeah tarpley yet again almost breaking it you can see why travis tarpley has racked up as many stats as he has i mean he's preseason all miak set the record for delaware state receptions last year he's led the league in all purpose yards as well he joins justin wilson among the top 10 receivers in Delaware State history. He has really racked up the numbers. First and 10 now from the 31. They'll come out throwing. And Elko, who's had a great game, finds Tarpley. Probably not getting into him soon enough, but Tim Breaker there on the coverage. We want to remind you, in just about four or five minutes, we will be sending you out to beautiful San Diego, California. Paul Burmeister and Rod Woodson have the call as Army, the Black Knights, head out to take on San Diego State, the Aztecs. And we will have that game for you right here on the NBC Sports Network. For those of you who want to see the conclusion of this game and the awarding of the first state cup, you can check us out at NBCSports.com. And that's where the conclusion of this game will be after that 45-minute weather delay we had at halftime that has pushed us well into the window of San Diego State. We are now down to the final 215. So there's a chance we could say goodbye to you here on the NBC Sports Network. Well, and even though Delaware is going to win this football game. I think everybody involved in this game can see the strides yep. that Delaware State has made. They are a much improved team from a year ago. Coach Blunt in his second year and his staff, they have this team going in the right direction. I mean, they still have more total yards than Delaware. Think about that. Compare and contrast that to last year right. where they were dominating every facet of the game. Right, and only picked up three wins. He said that was not a three-win team. Much better than that, and they're showing it on the field, and I think Casey Keeler and the Delaware Blue Hands will certainly attest to that because those first two drives, and you can always say woulda, coulda, is a beautiful pass finding Tarpley across the middle. They'll move the chains all the way down to the 32. You think about they convert the field goal and they don't get the pick six. That's a 10-point swing, and that really took a, so much momentum away from what the Hornets were doing. Yeah, I think that they'll be able to do some damage in the MEAC. I, I really do. I mean, last year, um, they took their lumps, but they are much improved. As long as they stay healthy with Wilson and Tarpley and Williams, So a nice pickup there, first and 10 from the 33. Elko drops it down the screen, has Williams on the inside, reverses field, cuts it back inside, and he's inside the 30-yard line, taken down at the 29 as we go inside the final minute to play. And this is, and I know it's a cliche thing, these guys are playing for pride now. Delaware State is playing hard. I know Delaware's backed off, and they're into more of a nickel, even a dime coverage, but the the coach has got to be happy the way the offense is still fighting. And you can learn as much about your team as anything with who plays hard in these situations. Coaches watch this tape diligently to see who's playing hard and who's not. Four receivers set for Elko. Steps up in the pocket, looks, has his man outside. Connection made, steps out of bounds. Does Justin Bruton. Now down to the 20-yard line. So now Elko can take some shots in the end zone and maybe bring this score down just a little bit. It's 38-14. 31 seconds remaining in the game. For those of you watching, we will be sending you out to Paul Burmeister, Rod Woodson in San Diego, California, where the Aztecs and head coach Rocky Long will be taking on Army as they come calling on the West Coast. That's immediately following us here on the NBC Sports Network.
Inside screen once again, Justin Wilson, and a nice play there down to the 12-yard line. Paul Worlo still in the game, and he does make the stop, and they will be just short of first down, but a timeout coming by Delaware State. They want to talk this thing over with 22 seconds to play in the game. Well, that goes to show you it's about more than pride at this point. I mean, they, they want to get in the end zone again. And you know what? Why not? I mean, you waited long enough at halftime yeah. with the delay. You've had a nice drive here, even if it's just for the confidence of your offensive unit. Well, 38-21 in a drive back to Dover sounds a lot better than 38-14 in a drive back to Dover. There's no doubt about it. I'm telling you, I, I think that this Delaware State team is much improved over last year. I, I, I would venture to guess, Todd, three or four wins. I might not take them next week as they travel to Cincinnati, and Cincinnati just put a beat down on a couple teams. Head coach Butch Jones doing a great job with the Bearcats. Then it's Florida A&M. Then they go to Norfolk State, and then a tough trip to Orangeburg, South Carolina to take on the Bulldogs of South Carolina State. Second down and two from the 12. 22 seconds to play in the ballgame. Elko on the fake, decides to look outside, pulls it back in. Now he'll just throw it out of the back of the end zone. That was a smart play. Nothing there. Live to fight another day with 15 seconds to play in this game. I'm surprised Elko not taking a shot in the end zone. Well, he couldn't find anybody that was open, and I don't think he wanted to throw his third pick of the game. You know, he'd rather live for another down or maybe another two downs here to try to get in the end zone. Blue Hens playing with six defensive backs. They still have Tunstall, Brewer, Hawkins, and Burley, and they number one, two, three, and four, and that was not by accident. Third and two. Tarpley in motion. Elko looking quick, has to throw it up and high, and that one again was at late high and across the middle. Good coverage there by Tunstall. So fourth and two with 11 seconds to play in the ball game. And the Hornets have one more big play in their pocket. So for now, we will send you out to San Diego, California and Paul Burmeister. Uh, more patience in the pocket. You know the defense played well. They played great in the second half, but last year they did not play well against this offense because it's a hard offense to stop. Army won the toss. They deferred, so San Diego State head coach there, Rocky Long. His team gets the football first. We sat down and spent some time watching the San Diego State offense, which we're going to see here momentarily playing week one against Washington. 